Hi, everyone, and welcome to Techno Crime Fighters, episode number 36. This is our Thanksgiving special. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. And um, hope you're having a restful and um, break-like week. Oh, dear, I've got that thing going again. Let me pause that. Okay, I've done that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so this morning, we're a little bit thin on guests, but it, it's going to be Catherine and me holding the floor. Dr. Catherine Horton and myself. I just wanted to open this uh, morning, however, with just a little brief heads up to everybody who may be new and watching us for the first time, that what the Techno Crime Fighters Forum is all about is about revealing the extremely horrific um, assaults on various people, both in the USA and in various countries in Europe and various countries in Asia, the Americas, the other Americas, you know, I'm here in North America, also in South America, and Australia, New Zealand, in fact, all over the world. Um, these are results of electromagnetic weapons, um, millimeter wave weapons, scalar weapons, all sorts of covert radiation weaponry, ultrasonic assaults, etc., that governments, military groups, and intelligence agencies are directing at citizens, at their own citizens, in actions of extreme repression. And uh, falling under the rubric of surveillance, but really, um, engaging in surveillance abuse of the worst kind. And under this umbrella, what's also happened is people have been human trafficked. This is literally human trafficking. Human trafficked into covert weapons testing programs, electronic weapons testing programs of the same kind, uh, being run by militaries, air forces, navies, etc., And uh, neuro weapon testing programs straight from the NSA, CIA, DHS um, in the US and various other intelligence agencies. Um, in other parts of the world. So what we are doing literally is we are standing up and speaking out and revealing the actuality and the factuality of these weapons assaults on humans around the world. And uh, we are doing this because mainstream media is not merely covering it up, it is printing lies and defamation and libel about the people coming forward to report these crimes, because obviously these are crimes, these are crimes of the worst kind, they're crimes against humanity, and they are tantamount to what went on, you know, in the Second World War and other horrific wars all through time. We are in the midst of a war, but it is a covert war. And there are all sorts of aspects to it, including psychological warfare. So I think we'll be delving a little bit into that as well this morning. So just a little heads up on that subject and um, on that note, Morning, Catherine. Hello, hello. I can just, uh, you know, just confirm everything you say. And I apologize for the background that has been getting increasingly worse. But what you mean by, you know, an actual war and um, this sort of attack on the civilian population and the extreme repression, it's, um, I, I, I would like to underline that and even, you know, make put it into even stronger terms. I think we are dealing with um, an all-out war, an actual hot shooting war against the civilian population in Europe and the US, and um, and, and the to total uh, uh, unleashing of unbridled bridled Nazi um, warfare, Nazi experimentation on, on the civilian population. And to just put it into context, so what um, I have been doing is I actually today, what I wanted to do is finally announce the um, final version of the affidavit template which went bottom up because um, the entire day yesterday I had to spend, well, the day before and yesterday reinforcing the bunker that I'm actually in because now the attacks have become so severe that I can't even exist in my own flat. I'm being machine gunned with electromagnetic machine guns. And it, um, for the last two years, I couldn't use my living room and my dining room. So I'm living in the other part of the house. And the problem is it's, uh, you know, beautiful rooms, big windows, but um, I'm being machine gunned from Nazi neighbors. So now imagine I'm already living in my study. I already had the bunker that people saw. And now I had to totally seal it in. So I'm, I'm entirely surrounded on, you know, above me. I, I'm now sitting in a cubicle that's totally shielded because any other way I can't exist and I cannot work. Um, and um, this is this is absolutely horrific. And to, um, you know, to well, actually, I, I would like to show you something because I, I think people have got difficulties believing what we're saying because it's not visual. So I'm sorry about this, but I want to show people something. So I'm, I'm just sitting here in my T-shirt and I want to show you. I'm not sure if you can see. I want to show you what a bullet hole looks like. 
can you probably the, the oh there you can just about see if the camera adjusts that is the beginning this thing it's the size of the tip of my finger it's the beginning of a bruise i'm not sure if my camera can pick it up if i move yeah, it around this yeah yeah sort of now minimal. that is a fresh bruise that's why it's so light blue i mean by the end of techno forum that will turn black but that is that roughly the tip of my finger is the size of an electromagnetic pulse and i've got these bruises all down my legs because when i sleep i'm being machine gunned with these things so i'm showing it for people first as evidence that what we're saying is genuinely the truth and second of all i want people to photograph all of these injuries because these weapons are of one make they've got roughly the same beam size and mm -hmm. we need to put now all the evidence together because this is absolutely serious so um you know i want people to understand that uh, when we mean active shooting war we really do mean that you know we've got active shooters ramola has active shooters in buildings next to her and so do i and if i just get out of my bunker and i'm just standing in my study i'm already shot at and if i cross my own flat to go to the kitchen to make myself a cup of tea i get machine gunned um so this is and the same here yeah Absolutely. And I can, you know, corroborate entirely with what you're saying. And that term, I think, active shooter is something someone else introduced to us, but I think it's highly opposite. It's very relevant. It, it completely relates to what's happening over here, because literally I'm experiencing very similarly to you, career pulse shots directed at all parts of my anatomy, my head, like this morning, just waking up, I was hit in the heart, in the head, and all over my body. So literally I was holding up a shield and I don't even podcast without a shield so this is my shield my little makeshift shield it's it's a cookie sheet it's a small cookie sheet teflon bakeware wrapped with reflectics and it's got you know this is just black duck canvas over it literally i carry it around everywhere i go i put it in a tote bag and i carry it around um and i'm using it at my heart because something that they are doing is literally hitting my heart constantly and you can hear it you know you can hear these hits and as you have recorded um you know using an audio recorder and you've encouraged all of us to do um i have recorded this so i have this evidence i'm being continuously hit in addition of course you know to try, trying to pull out all the little meters we have and trying to record it on the meters as well um and it's an ongoing battle isn't it trying to find the right meters to do this it, it really is and like in my case i mean the meters were actually um stolen from me so that really mm -hmm. highlights i think that um any sort of measurements and evidence collecting that we're doing is hugely damaging to the other side i mean obviously um but also bit by bit we learn how this entire thing um is being done and actually um one of the things i would like to announce is um two things so number one the the entire war situation has become so severe that I decided to do daily updates. The very first update was, you know, an hour. So it's not going to be that long. I sometimes will just speak for five or 10 minutes. But um, now I really think that as we're moving into this hot war phase, we need to have, you know, daily updates and talk to people around the world. And I wanted to inform absolutely everybody about the things that I'm doing, because during the day, I'm just speaking to so many people from around the world about court cases that are launching, people being attacked, attempted murder. You know, it's, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. So I thought we need to speed up our communication channels. And so far we had Techno Forum as a platform, but now I think um, as it's heating up, we really need to have these sort of communications. And I encourage all the victims to do the same, not least for the reason that these people are trying to take us out and we need to know if we're fine, basically. I mean, in an ideal world, I would want to have all the TIs at night check in by just uploading a short video and tweeting it out, you know. Um, but that's, that's the situation right now. And the second thing I would like to announce and um, if people go, um, actually for me personally, that was a breakthrough in terms of evidence collecting. Um, if people go to my um, uh, YouTube channel, let me just bring up the video. So my YouTube channel is called Stop 007. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you go there, hang on, um, there is a new video and I'll share my screen and show you in a moment. Um, and the new video is called, um, let me share my screen because this is something that I think all people should, um, should replicate. Um, this video here, the first one is called Electronic Rape. 
what the chip signal sounds like. So you can see me, that's how I have to sit to just block out the shots to my head. This was before my bunker was totally reinforced. But then one of the things you can do, uh, you can see here is that I'm using this measuring device. By the way, this is a, a more expensive version of the little green box that I have, the Acousticom 2. So the little green box was stolen and I was left with this thing. And what you can see here is that it's measuring very low radiation. I had it at the setting of 200 micro, so maximum 200 microwatts per square meter. So the, the most sensitive setting. And it's measuring now inside my bunker something like three or sometimes even less than three microwatts per square meter. This is really low radiation. But what's important in the video is the audio output. Because what I was doing is at the time I was being raped electronically. And um, I just turned on this measuring device and I thought, right, I'm now in a shielded environment. What do the signals sound like? And the backgrounds were very low and suddenly I could hear this beeping signal. And during electronic rape, this beeping was just continuous. It was like one continuous beep. And then later on in the video, if you go down, you kind of have to listen carefully to pick out the audio, but I put in minute marks. So from the first three uh, minutes or almost four minutes, it's the electronic rape phase. Then it suddenly stops and you can hear the beeping go off. And then in the, um, the seconds after that, you can hear the beeping on and off, on and off, pulsing again. And then you can actually hear what it sounds like, what the beeping sounds like as opposed to the background. Now, um, I, you know, I, I think because every single victim is being raped electronically, I think what people have to do is stop being embarrassed about that, you know, and just start measuring this and videoing this, you know, videoing how they are being accessed. And um, for those people who don't know, the way it's done is that, um, as far as I can tell, all of us have been covertly implanted with microchips in hospitals or just by people breaking into hotel rooms or into our homes. And these chips are being, being accessed remotely. Um, and they can cause pain, they can cause uh, cramps and, you know, everything. Um, in women, they can place them into, I think, the uh, uterine muscles and cause contractions and, you know, and, and, you and know, a million on, things. On that note, just about women being implanted in, the, in their private parts, I just wanted to make a note because several people have said this to me. And um, I also have doubts about my own self. When people go to their gynecologist for pap smears, and, you know, the gynecologist says, I'm just going to take a biopsy just to find out if you're safe from a free from cervical cancer, you know. And even when people say no, just because the gynecologist is indeed going in there with his or her speculum and various other, um, you know, implements, people have reported that they've had biopsies taken. And at the time of biopsies being taken, they feel they've been implanted because they are, uh, in can they are experiencing vibration um emanating from those areas you know so this is so extremely sinister and insidious but it needs to be mentioned we cannot trust our doctors and gynecologists anymore and this is a big big issue you know the issue of the medical field being co-opted this is not to say that every surgeon and doctor and gynecologist over there is a part of this but there are certainly some that are, and many people are coming forward today to report that. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, throw that I, I think this is really important because I, for one, can confirm 100% that the German intelligence, BND, so when I used to live in Munich, I used to live in Munich Zone, which is right next to Pulach, and Pulach is where the BND is headquartered traditionally. So now they also moved to Berlin, but Pulach is where they are. And it's basically like the Death Star, you know, and I just moved there not knowing that they're there. And one day I just looked on Google Maps and saw BND, <laughs> literally sprawling complex. Oh my right. God, you know, at the end of my street. So, um, but these people are swarming there. Yeah, you've got agents crawling all over the place there. Um, in the area where I used to live, they used to train, um, the young people, so, you know, twice um, per year, or actually, I think thrice per year, they used to have little rounds where I just looked out of the window and two Italian guys were standing at the street corner talking for four hours, and you had these clueless teenagers with mobile phones coming around. So that was the BND training round. And um, the doctors, there were a lot of doctors in the area. And at the time, I didn't know, and I went to see a uh, gynecologist, and what he did is he actually engaged in street theater. 
So, you know, it was a new new doctor and I just went there and it was just, um, he asked me to register. And then he started asking me all these questions of when did we come to Germany? You know, where's my family? What did my family do? And he, it, he just went on and on and on. And at some point it was really strange where I thought, hang on, this is not part of the registration. And I just stopped and just looked at him. And then he looked at me and he saw that I finally twigged it, that this wasn't normal. And he laughed. He actually laughed me in the face. And... Um, when this is before an examination, you think, well, German intelligence just wants to humiliate you to say, we are going to get into, you know, every last private and intimate moment you have. So I can confirm that they are that sick in the head. And, you know, judging by this guy's behavior, I mean, he would have implanted me at the drop of a hat, you know. Yes, and you see the situation that we are existing in currently does make one wonder, who can you trust? And, you know, on the subject of doctors, of course, there's that whole story with me uh, ending up in the ER for my finger. And I kind of wanted to tell that whole story when Millicent was here because she has an opposing viewpoint, which I think is very uh, helpful because we can uh, really de debate publicly. Where those of us who are already targeted and, you know, we, we know we are targeted, we're being hit with weapons. When we end up in ERs, you know, for various reasons, um, many people have come forward and told stories of how they've gone in for a migraine or, you know, something else, and then they get uh, thrown in psych wards because they've mentioned they hit with radiation weaponry. So I, of course, did not mention that I was being hit with radiation weaponry, and Melissa is of the opinion that I should have mentioned it. So, you know, I um, am wondering really if I should go into the story right now or if I should wait till Millicent, um, you know, is on our show again for us to talk about this. But I think either way, you know, the uh, the most important takeaway message is that. Um, you know, I mean, that, that's this question is about should we start campaigning when you're in ER and then you know at the mercy of these people might be agents. You know, I'm yeah. not sure. I mean, the experience with uh, with Melanie, I wasn't campaigning. I was just honestly concerned for her well-being, and um, now it just and blew blew up into this insanity. So I almost think that um, you know, I think you've done the right thing, and we should um, you know we should reserve the campaigning for court cases. <laughs> But um, reserve the campaigning for the court cases. Well, yeah, yeah, but the whole story itself, should I go into it right oh, now? Yeah. Just sort of, I, I think people need to just, hear. Okay, maybe just tell the basic gist of the story. So, this finger, as everyone can see, well, one of the silly bandages coming off at this point in time and doing a bad job with it. But that's my ring finger, and I love rings, and I have five rings on there. And there was a gap in between sort of the first two and the last three, I think evening I think I was sitting on my couch this was literally three or four weeks ago and um, I was hit at that very spot between the rings and I could feel it when it was hit when I when I got hit it felt like a very beam hitting my ring finger okay and you know I'm being hit all the time with various through various means and I've and, and I've had bad injuries before I think I've been I've gotten those laser burns you know in, on my body and I've gotten uh, literally second degree burns as well and always inside in my breast area you know people are not going to go out and take pictures and put it on put it online etc because obviously those are your you know those are your breasts you're not going to put it on display uh, <laughs> So when this hit, I, I, I knew I was hit by something and I kind of didn't pay it any attention. And then I later noticed it had blistered up pretty badly, video and pics of it and everything. Um, and I started to treat it with aloe vera because I thought it was a simple burn. And I looked online for information on how to treat burns. And I'm the kind of person who doesn't go to the doctor anyway. I don't, the paradigm is kind of old to me and I focus on natural and holistic treatments and so forth. So that's what I did. So I looked online and the info I got online was a blister is nothing much to worry about. It'll go away. Just put some aloe vera or some something on it. And so I used aloe vera and castor oil and I was healing. I, I thought I was healing it. It seems to be responding, you know, and the skin was peeling off and everything. It looked fine. It looked like it was healing. And then what happened was because I guess I've been talking about it and showing it to people, I guess the people who are hitting me, uh, whom I know people call the perpetrators all the time, um, became aware of this and they began to hit me again and again on that finger as it was healing. 
So as I was sleeping a couple of times, I woke up in excruciating pain and even um, greater, you know, it seemed to be inflamed again. And it was inflamed on both sides of the rings. Now, now remember the rings were stuck over there. See, that was my problem. So I kept thinking, I'll, um, when it subsides, I can slide the rings off. But it wasn't subsiding. My finger was getting inflamed. Things were, you know, I was starting to freak out. And then one night, it got really bad. This was last week, I think Wednesday night. I was hit again, woke up in the morning in extreme pain. And I had to take ibuprofen, even though I never take these things. Um, and I went to, my, to an acupuncturist that I had gone to before. Well, he took one look at it and he said, you have to go to the hospital. So, okay, so I, I was really <laughs> in a state of needing help, clearly needing medical help. So I decided, okay, I'm not going to act like an idiot. I will go to the hospital. So I went actually to Quincy Medical Care, urgent care walk-in. I called them and I explained the situation. They said, okay, you can come in. I was a nurse practitioner, not, you know, a doctor or anything. And she took a look and she said, oh, we have to get the rings off. So I said, okay, and they tried to, but the rings were too tight, so they couldn't do it and without an aesthetic. So they sent me to Quincy Hospital, the emergency um, care, Quincy Hospital locally. So I went there, and there were a few doctors, there were a few residents. Um, and apparently now Quincy Hospital, I don't know how these doctors, uh, how these hospitals are running it, but Quincy Hospital is apparently the emergency care section in Quincy for Kearney Hospital in Dorchester. Boston. So that's what they told me. So they said, look, we don't have um, surgeons here. We don't have a burn unit here. There, because they tried again to remove the, the rings and they couldn't do it, you know, because they had these sort of massive pliers and stuff, which there was no way they were going to slide in there without an aesthetic, you know. So, and again, they seemed to, to be very worried about an aesthetic. They didn't want to touch it. They didn't want to use an aesthetic on my hand. So they sent me downtown and they said I had a choice between Brigham and Mass General. So now I know Mass General was involved in MK Ultra. And you know, probably Brigham is too. I have to go back and look at my notes. Connected to Harvard. But all of this don't, you know, strike my mind at the time. I said, oh okay, I'll take Brigham because I kind of knew the area. It's near the MFA. It's the Longwood area of Boston. I've been there before. So I said, okay, I'll go to Brigham. Um, so I went home because we have just one car. I went home. I dropped the car off. I took a cab. I went down to, um, to Brigham. Okay, so now this is a big, big university hospital right in the heart of downtown. It's an emergency room. Literally, I had to explain my story over and over to several people. Now, you see, because I... Um, state and I'm the kind of person that doesn't go to doctors and I did not want to deal with this whole you know psych ward scenario I just wanted to get my finger taken care of so I I came up with a story well okay I'm a fiction writer all right so I do make up stories now. so <laughs> I decided my story would be boiling water a little bit of boiling water fell on my finger and create the blister and I decided to stick to it and you know I did times I had to tell the stupid story because <laughs> first it was the guy at the desk, then it was the triage nurse who took down, you know, the basic info and then took my blood pressure and stuff like that and wrote down the notes. And I have to say, once you walk into a hospital, they're all looking at you as if saying anyway. <laughs> they're looking at you as if you are a patient. I think the, the formulation or confabulation of patients, the way these docs and the way everybody in the you know, administration is that the patient is on a lesser plane and we are the case managers and, you know, we are figuring it out and we are running the show. So there's sort of a top-down thing going on there already, you know. So I'm getting all these skeptical looks all the time. So, I, you know, I plowed ahead nevertheless. You don't even know how you got it? Um, and I'm like, no, 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 I do know how I got it. So you see how I fell into that silly trap when I could very well have said, I have no idea how I got it. I was just sitting on the couch and this happened. You know, I could have said that because that would have been a testament to what is actually going on. As people are sitting on couches and people are being hit with millimeter wave weapons and with lasers from outside.
that are better dreaming boys. And I said, I'm a DI. In other words, I'm a targeted person who is being hit on a regular basis. So I could have said that, and this is what Millicent, you know, said that I, Millicent basically said that I was giving the perps an alibi, coming up with a boiling water story. So she's got a very good point. And this is why I want to, you know, discuss it publicly. And I want to discuss it with her a little bit further. Um, so in any case, so I didn't say that. And I said, oh, boiling water to look like an idiot and I was striving hard, obviously egoistic, striving hard to, uh, to kind of make some ground here for myself and say, no, no, I do know what's going on. I was hit with boiling water. <laughs> you know, it was just boiling water. So <laughs> that's the extent of my idiocy. So um, first, and then I go in and, the, and another nurse comes by and takes a lot of information. And she says, and what's your educational background and how many degrees do you have? And, um, blah, blah, do you, you know, have, do you have any other diseases? Do you have allergies? So the kind of things they ask you in hospitals. And I, say, and I said, um, I gave them whatever responses they wanted. And um, it was becoming rather famous. People started to come by just to look at my finger because it was looking pretty horrendous. You know, it, was, it had this blister, it was inflamed. And uh, people were coming by, and I was sort of Frankenstein at that moment. So <laughs> Frankenstein's monster. So um, after a while, another nurse came by with um, a couple dogs. I gathered the. It was a, a resident and um, supervising the resident, who I guess she was also a dog. And then there was a nurse, and they all clustered, and they said we're going to take care of it. And you know, yes, we have to remove the rings. Blah blah. And then uh, the nurse stayed behind to chat with me. And, you know, she was very friendly. And she was, you know, we were just having a conversation about how terrible. And, you know, I was telling her what I'd been doing to, to, to help heal it, et cetera. And she, she seemed very interested and friendly and you know, charming and all that stuff. And then I said, well, you know, well, I just have to ask you this. Um, but, uh, who do you live with? husband um i was going to say my daughter as well but you know she just sort of jumped right in and she said um and you feel safe at home you know no domestic violence or anything like that so i'm thinking i come in with a kind of an inflamed finger and i'm being asked questions about domestic violence at home that's very interesting nothing like that which is true um, and um, then she said, and she said, oh, you know, we have to ask these questions, you know, and if there's any, you really feel safe at home and there's no suicide. But home and suicide go together. I was kind of trying to, you know, she was going and where she was coming from with these questions. I was just looking at her. And um, no thought of suicide? No. You know, I'm sitting there, I'm on my cell phone, I'm calling people, I'm texting. I'm talking to these doctors, why would I be asked if I had thought of suicide? Now, I don't know if this is, and I think somebody has told me, but these are, they have these sort of regular questions that they ask everybody as you go into a hospital. But why do they have those questions? And when you go into an emergency room with something else entirely, like I have cuts in my wrists or some indication that I'm a suicidal patient, I'm just there with a finger issue about suicide. So I just got a note of that. And then we went in and then, you know, they had hand surgeons come in from the burn unit or whatever, the trauma center. And those guys came, they were residents as well, but I have to say they were very competent. Um, you know, they pulled out their implements and they seemed to know how to do it. Well, they basically had to give me an estimate. They had to give me a whole bunch of it because, uh, um, you know, the finger was in bad shape. But in between, they left me, they, you know, they do this in emergency rooms all the time. They leave you, the emergency, the anesthetic wears off. They come back half an hour later. They're giving me more anesthetic around to see this massive operation in process. They finally get the rings off the finger, you know, and then they're sitting around thinking, shall we give her antibiotics and keep her overnight and put her on an IV and all this stuff. And then they say, oh, you, 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 you've got to get x-rays of your finger, etc." And they do all that. Okay. And then, in fact, I got x-ray twice because after the first x-ray, apparently they found a little bit of metal in the finger still. And they came back and they did the whole thing again. They opened it up and, um, the, the nurse who supervised the resident, I'm sorry, the, the doctor who supervised the resident earlier came in and 
said, oh, it should be better now. And I got x-rayed again. And when I came back, the, the nurse who'd asked me the, you know, the sad questions, she came back and she said, um, well, you know, we may also want to take, um, you know, we can, we want to test if you have white blood cell issues or, you know, an infection. So, ultimately, they didn't do that, but she was mentioning that. And it made me wonder, it made me wonder, because, you know, part of what's going on with me is I'm being hit so hard, and I constantly get a lot of innuendo from my feeds, and even people who call me, you know, about different kinds of cancer being irradiated, like I'm being massively irradiated all the time. And then I've got these cancer foundations calling me and a lot of innuendo that I might have or cervical cancer or pancreatic cancer or colon cancer or this, that or the other, some kind of cancer, you see. There's no doubt that if I am indeed in a surreptitious or clandestine irradiation process, that they would be interested in you know, getting a hold of my blood samples to see what the, the, blood, the white blood cell count is, et cetera, and how my body's reacting, if there is cancer in my body. Blood blood. But So I thought that that was very interesting. And then, you know, the other thing that was interesting with that whole visit was, of course, the guy who walked in and told me about the, the partner biobank scheme, apparently a research project, which he said, studying gene, society, and inheritance, and interactions. Uh, society and interactions uh, with the environment. So that's the project. And apparently all the hospitals are a part of it. And, and you know, I asked him, this is something else. This is a huge subject. I think we should talk about it, Catherine, because that is, you know, we looked it up a little bit and um, it involves a lot of hospitals in the Boston area. 70,000 people already uh, lined up, already um, signed up. They're trying to do it with informed consent. So, but they're trying to do it with, with consent. So basically, he told me he wanted my consent and my email address um, so that they could take a sample from me and use it for this project. And there's a lot of information online, and I think we should put the link online to this project so people can see what this project is about. Because literally, there's a lot of information there. He showed me the consent form as well, which had this info as well regarding how you really wouldn't have any control over how your cells would be used. Your cells could be used for further research. They could be used in lab animals. They could be used in other humans. So it's basically genetic research that they're trying to uh, extrapolate in different directions that you would have no control over. You would just sign up, give your blood sample, and that would be it. And it and a consensual end rule. So, you know, obviously I'm sitting here thinking, well, you know, I think I'm already in some research programs, unbeknownst to me, a completely non-consensual and unwilling participant. I am implanted to the hilt and um, I'm already being assaulted. There is no way I'm going to sign up for anything under the sun. But sure, hand me your consent form. I'll take a look at it. You can tell me where the website is. I'll go check it out. So, you know, I did get some information from him, which is great because now I can research it a bit and tell you guys about it. And, um, but I think because of that, there was a connection there to this woman asking for my blood sample, wanting to see the white blood cell count, et cetera. But in any case, she dropped the idea and I finally got to go home that night. The story ended. You see, because I did not say from the beginning that I was hit in some way, I don't know. You know, we didn't even go into the direction of radiation weaponry. Now, Milton told me that what she did, did has done before, and what she recommends, say that you are being targeted and you're being hit with radiation and energy weapons, but carry a folder with you of letters from various people, kind of attesting to your sanity and to your of mind and so on and so forth. So, you know, that's a huge issue. It's really interesting because as a journalist, this is what I am doing. I'm talking to people issue, you know, about um, their encounters in hospitals. And yet, when this journalist goes to the hospital, you can see how I chickened out utterly and I didn't want to deal with it at all. So, and that's kind of what I've been, you know, speaking openly about at this point in time to, to various people, you know, like Catherine and others, um, Dr. Ed Spencer, etc. What, I guess the question really is, when you go to a hospital, 
they were being assaulted with radiation weapons. Um, you in telling the truth, in telling them everything that is going on, instead of laying it out all out over there for them, and then kind of dealing with whatever follows, and simply not going there like I did, you know. So it's as I said, I'm open to discussing this, and you know, people can excoriate me as much as they like because it's true. I I, I did chicken out. I, I don't think you chickened out at all, actually. I think overall you've done the right thing because actually the way the strategy you chose, which is not say anything, from what you have said, reading between the lines, I think um, there's a lot of very interesting aspects about the story, how the hospital behaved actually. And I would like to flag a couple of things. And when I, when I really listed it in my mind, I came to the conclusion that this was a partially a setup you know, we have to remember, and we will talk about this later, that over the last couple of weeks and months, we, our, the joint investigation team has come under um, very hot fire. You know, I mean, Melanie had a takedown operation in the middle of October in Hospital Erasmus. There was other things that we'll talk about later. But every single investigator is being attacked. And when they can get you into, an, into a hospital, they love it because they, you know, they think you're totally under their control. And... Um, you know, somebody made a very good point. I think it was Catherine Hines. And she said, people have to understand that hospitals these days are not what hospitals were in the 20th century. If you go into a hospital and you've got a 20th century um, mental image of what you're dealing with, you're in for surprise. Because now a lot of um, hospitals are actually private or through the back door privatized, whereby they're nominally maybe a university hospital owned by the state, but actually the crime cartel did get their hand on it because either they are paying the state and they are giving some grant money. You know, grants are wonderful fronts for the, um, uh, for the mafia as well. But um, actually, um, people have been complaining about organ trafficking in hospitals in the UK about people being used for um, medical testing, about people being given horrific, um, um, you know, bugs and every sort um, every uh, strange things. And then basically the medical profession running experiments and bio warfare testing on them. For example, one of the things that spread was this um, notion in the UK of superbugs. And it, they are so famous now in the UK that, um, you know, it's like one of the standard jokes that you go into the hospital, you know, with a, a mild flu and you die of a superbug. And they just seem to pretend like, oh, superbugs, like something that people have never heard of and that can wipe you out in three days would be normal for hospital. And it's just, oh, it's just part of the germs that's just floating around in hospital. But hang on a second. These superbugs don't float about in the population. It's the population going into the hospital. So where the F do they come from? Well, I have to say as a system analyst, everything points to the fact that they come from an MI5 biowarfare lab. All right. So forget about this thing about, oh, superbugs. No, what's actually happening is that the intel agencies are running human experiments on us. And how um, as the intelligence agencies and the military and this entire, you know, Nazi conglomerate expanded, so have these very weird stories about hospital incidents, you know, that people go in to, I don't know, have their append appendix removed and they have their appendix removed and the kidney. <laughs> hey, you know, happens. <laughs> so where, does, where do these stories come from, you know? <laughs> yes, there's all sorts of horrific stories. And you know, the other thing I wanted to mention also was um, Catherine, what you also experienced, I think, in Erasme Hospital in Belgium, oh. is that the entire time that I was there, I was being hit with microwaves, you know. I was blasted. I was I was hit in the heart. I could feel my nerves being flickered. And um, I was hit in my private parts, just sitting there. And um, those were the three main things that I recall. And I remember when I was in the Quincy, Medical Care, uh, Quincy Urgent Care, the walk-in place, which was pretty empty when I went in, but as soon as I went in, um, a couple of guys came charging in and said they were there for DOT, and I don't know what that was exactly, whether it had something to do with occupational therapy, OT, you know. I don't know. In any case, what happened was these guys who looked like they were workers, you know, they had pain stained. DOT, DOT that's the defense occupational therapy, isn't it? <laughs> it's what, they, what the intel agencies <laughs> do to their that, training. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's entirely what entirely possible. Because you know what? These guys came in with little weapons in their pockets. And I'll tell you how I figured that out. Because I, I was taken into a little room. And um, just outside the room is a corridor. And apparently there is like an eye chart at the end of the corridor. And as soon as I went and sat in the room, I was fine. I didn't experience hits. 
I literally wear organite all over my body because I'm being hit in certain areas and being hit at the heart. So I'm wearing either a river stone or organite at my heart. Um, and I, sorry to say this on, you know, national TV or whatever this is right now online for the whole world to see, but I'm wearing organite in my underwear to protect my private parts. You know, and I have to do it on a regular basis or I am hit there. You know, and I think every one of us who's being hit is some um, understanding of this whole phenomenon of electronic rape on which we actually did a round table a little while ago, and which I will write up about because I think it's, it's very important to point out that especially American and European women are being raped in their houses, in their beds, electronically with these radiation weapons. So, you know, I guess I shouldn't have any qualms about actually saying that I do wear organized my underwear to protect myself. So I'm sitting over there and these guys walk by and they're standing right in front of the door, sort of in a diagonally to where I'm sitting. And as soon as they come and stand there and they start reading their letters, you know, T, G, E, F, G, kept and organite is, is um, you know, recording these hits and I can hear it. Luckily for me, I'm wearing organite. <laughs> but they, are sta they were standing there and hitting me with their little microwave weapons or cell phone modified microwave weapons or whatever that they just stick in their back, back pocket. You know, I, and I've experienced this elsewhere. So that's why I'm speculating that that's how it was conducted. I think you're yeah, right. And if they're reading out letters, the only way is to shout from your room, F U C K O F F. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes, I should have had you there with me, Catherine, <laughs> to do that. But exactly. You know, so that's one way in which they were doing it. They actually had people walk in. And when I was alone, the other hospital, I did notice that. People came in after me and got put in the little rooms next to me. And some of the visitors of these patients kept walking up and down with their cell phones. And one of them sort of sat diagonally opposite from me with her cell phone. And I did notice a few technicians and a few orderlies also standing around against corridors. You know, in that way that stalkers have of informing TIs that they are being surveilled. They come and stand right in front of you, in your field of view, and they're pointing their cell phones at you and they look at you very meaningfully and they're kind of pointing cell phones to you. And before you know it, you're being hit. So literally, they could be triangulating or GPS tracking or whatever. And they're also trying to let you know that you're being surveilled. But obviously, this is assault, assault and battery, you know, assault and battery with collaborative participants is what it really is. Yeah. And it's running under cover of surveillance. And I can't say that enough times. You know, because that's what's happening in this country. It's happening in the USA. This is surveillance abuse. There are lots of wrongful terms. And I think the term targeted individual has kind of fallen into disrepute. It's, it's, it's a term that we all use because it's shorthand at this point in time. But um, obviously, it uh, has come to mean so many wrongful things. We are reporting victims of radiation crime, radiation weaponry crime, and electronic weaponry crime. And these, uh, these crimes are being run by fusion centers and by agencies with access to these weapons. You know, and humanity needs to stand up and say that, and see that and say that. The, the, these powers have to be stripped from these agencies. They have no right to be assaulting anybody with these deadly carcinogenic weapons, absolutely. You know, and they're doing it inside hospitals. And there are people who are involved. So, Technicians are involved, orderlies are involved, nurses are involved, visitors of patients are involved. That's what, my, that's what I experienced. And because Brigham is right in the middle of town, you can just imagine that right outside, you could have like a huge truck set up, you know, with an active denial system or a microwave antenna system inside of it um, to, to pump in energy. Or it could be coming from the cell antennas on light poles everywhere. It could be coming from the towers that are surrounding the area. Because I was sitting inside the hospital, I was not in the basement, I was in the, on the ground floor, and I got perfect reception when I was on the phone, you know, on my cell phone. There's Wi-Fi everywhere. You know, as long as there is Wi-Fi, then you can imagine that there is medium to hit us as well with yeah. these um, microwave pulse weapons. I, I think, you know, your entire trip to the hospital is a goldmine for analysis because... Um, 
and, and actually goldmine for discussion because everything you said, I have um, experienced in Hospital Erasmus. And if we just list these things, it's um, first of all, the fact that um, people are being hit in hospitals. And there are lots of YouTube videos where people have, you know, typically, curiously, heart problems and they're in a hospital bed and they are saying, I'm being hit now in the hospital bed on the station. Yeah. That's right. I have. I was hit on the maternity ward when I was um, there with Melanie. I was hit in the operating theater. You know, she was strangulated in the operating theater with the implants, the bit of the implant that's still in her throat. Yeah. And one of the things I photographed in Melanie's um, hospital room is that every room in Erasmus Hospital has a big fat Wi-Fi router. It's massive. It's like twice the size of my Wi-Fi router at home. And every room has that by Cisco Systems. And I'm wondering, Cisco Systems, could they possibly be involved in this? Because these Wi-Fi routers would have to have the frequency that communicates with body chips. So could it be that these are special Wi-Fi routers up there that have all these functionalities and, and can actually communicate? Entirely possible. And, you know, on that note, I should say just recently, Newsbot had, um, was looking at the defense budget. And one of the things they noticed in the defense budget was a huge amount of money, I think 1.9 billion or something like that, going to these telecom companies, to AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, etc., for surveillance-related equipment. I Five think months. that's it. I think that's it. Oh, my God, Ramon, I think you hit the jackpot. I think that's exactly what it is. And everybody thinks, oh, this is just to get our email and survey us. Like, no, that mm -hmm. they already can do that. That's already paid for. They put all the, you know, whatever, listening devices into the all the nodes everywhere. I mean, Bill Benny talks about it and he um, shows the diagram and he says, you know, all of these nodes, that's what they put in the listening and equipment. You know, you can, you can do all that. And that has been paid for and done and dusted. I think you're right. This is now the entire and architecture. I, so, uh, so I think that's the how they're doing it. That's how the architecture is being built up. Because think about it. What does a telecom company have to do with microwave weapons? But I think that's how they have wrapped it in. It, because they already have the infrastructure, right, around town. They have the infrastructure. They, they are the ones right. putting the antennas up on the light poles, you know. And they're the ones now, I, I, I understand 5G is being sneaked into towns um, without permission. Although there's a lot of, you know, everybody is upset about 5G and nobody wants it. Because 5G is 10 times worse than what we have already in terms of Wi-Fi. <clears throat> it's sort of like a millimeter wave weapon on a light bulb if we have 5G. Yeah, I think that's so, exactly what it is. It's, a, it's an integrated weapon system that can kill within an instant. And they want us to pay for it and put it up in our neighborhoods. I think that's exactly it. And if you... Right, if you, and because... And they've started to do it already, apparently. I understand they've started to do it on the West Coast. Um, it could well be on the East Coast as well. It's something to investigate, you know. Mm. I, I think the other thing that's also um, extremely important is, first of all, the heads up and, and also, um, you know, bringing all these people together who have been attacked in hospitals. Because if you get attacked, you know, on, on the East Coast in the US, I get attacked in Brussels in the hospital. It shows that this is a global system. So we should also contact all the people who put up YouTube videos saying how, you know, they're being attacked in hospitals and so on. And let's think about it. What a huge business plan when you when you loaded people's bodies with chips and then you can simulate illnesses especially mm -hmm. heart disease right you can give people arrhythmia and a lot of other things by either these nanobots or microchips that migrate into the heart and get stuck or whatever you know and you can do that or just hit them directly in the heart and you can then just you can hit them directly in the heart because i think yeah. they're doing that i think they are coming up with the right frequencies and they are hitting the sternum because you know literally i have to because i'm hit so much in the heart i seem to become an expert in heart shielding they hit right here in the sternum, you know, right in the middle to create a sense of congestion or pressure. So literally, if I wear overnight up here, up here, I'm able to protect myself. That's, so they, that's, that's brilliant. That's a favorite spot for them, hitting up here. And then they also hit right in the heart area, you know. So yeah. literally, I have to wear a sport bra and duck piece of overnight right there. That's so... Heart. That's, I mean, first of all, that's top defense information, people. You know, if you're being attacked like that, you need to have, you know, cookie sheets ideally with you, but also certainly you need to have little, I'm not sure what it is about the organite. Is it the spiraling met metal that just reflects signals and, and just scatters it them? Is. In so such organite, a way? organite is a mixture of, um, it's a mixture of metallic bits mm -hmm. and a polymer that holds it together. There's two kinds of organite. I have a piece. Because I, people have been going on about organite. I think I this one is. This is 
yeah. So, so this, this is like, yeah, it has iron, I think. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a little bit of a funny shape. So you can use it for certain things, but not for everything, obviously. Yeah. But it's but useful. You know, it's very useful. It does, it does help. There is um, versions of Organite where the, the plastic or the, the gum, the rubber thing hold, holding it together is transparent. And when I looked at those, it seems yeah. to be metal shavings of odd shapes, spiral, curvy uh, spirals. And I suspect that that is scattering signals in a way that the computer can't handle, you know? Yeah, exactly. And the other thing that I would recommend is to get something small like this, which is oh, these, yes. it's, it's bakeware. It's a little tartlet pan or something like that. It's Teflon, it's, uh, it's Teflon coated, and it's um, steel core. That's, that's a lifesaver, actually. And that and one, we should also say, the people who have voice to skull, try, just try it out. Mm -hmm. Buy one of those two things, you know, for probably a dollar each, mm -hmm. and just hold mm -hmm. it on your ears because it should be able to block the signal slightly. And I noticed I'm being actually pulsed with these little shots that are the size of my finger. They're shooting into my ear canal. They're actually trying to just, you know, pop my, my eardrum as I'm sitting somewhere, if I'm exposed. Yeah, yeah. Something I've noticed is, you know, and this is something that I recommend to everybody as well. Literally, these signals are very directional. They are precision power pencil signals. So you can actually avoid them or shield from them very easily by just, if you sense them, just move slightly. I mean, I get hit in the ear also. They send that tone, you know, they send a high tone. And I just turn my ear and that's it. They can't hit my ear anymore. <laughs> They're like, damn, we need to get the other lorry. <laughs> Move the lorry. <laughs> and, you know, they do the same thing with the auditory cortex at the back. So they, I think they send a signal to the back of your head. So again, if you feel it or if you hear it, just move the back of your head a little bit. <laughs> And that's what I do. So I've got the sort of ready-made, you know, easy, easy shielding solutions over here. <laughs> so when I'm sitting at my computer, literally, they blast me. They hit me in the front. They hit me over here. And I just sort of keep turning slightly <laughs> and keep working away. <laughs> but frankly, so little movements, little micro movements also help. If you're sitting and reading, you know, you just want a little peace and quiet. You're sitting down. Just do a, a few conscious micro movements to throw because basically they're locking on in my case at least, you know, they're locking on to implants. My brain resonance frequencies, etc. Cetera, et cetera. They're locking on to implants. And um, I can feel the lock on sometimes right at the top of my head. There's an implant right at the top of my head. So if you do a uh, tiny little micro movements, you know, they can't lock onto anything. So. I, I, gosh, I think it's, it's like every single time I talk to Ramola, it's a goldmine of information and tips, really. And, so uh, think about it. How have I been able to, the last four years that I've been hit, I've been hit intensively. And some people can't believe it, but right from the beginning, I've been hit all over my body. Literally, I have had to use Reflectix. I know you've been using this aluminum foil, Catherine, but I have used Reflectix. And I've made little pads of metal inside them, you know, the, the, the kind of thing you get at the um, roofing section of the Home Depot, the flashing, they call it flashing. And I've wrapped it in a reflectix and put a little cloth around it to make it softer and stuck it all over my body. Because literally hitting my liver, my gallbladder, my heart, you know, my private parts, my everywhere. It's like, sorry, but I have, you know, things to do and, you know, magazines to run. I was running my Delphi Quarterly, my literary review quite um, regularly at that point in time. And I was running my children's creativity workshops at that time. So I just kept sticking things all over my body and I just kept going. Um, you know, things got sabotaged later and I have taken a break from some of those activities, but I'm going to get back to them eventually. But um, that's the only way to survive in my, in my point of view. You shield and you keep going. But, you know, you do spend a lot of time uh, also trying to stop it in terms of the, this is where I have failed. I have failed to contact authorities locally and to tell them to, you know, buzz off, stop doing this to me. Um, I, I have I failed to give them notification. I've tried, I've, I've spent a lot of time doing FOIA requests and things like that. I, I, so I think, you know what, there, you, we really need a campaign because I think all of us have tried it in a small way, but we really need a big tsunami wave again to just uh, launch tsunami it. Tsunami is brilliant, yes. And it it will come back. We're it all working come back. together. It will come back as soon as the bloody affidavits are finished. But uh, one of the things I wanted to say is actually in terms of shielding, because I find so many victims and actually reinforcing my bunker just reminded me how great life can be when you're not hit.
you know so i actually um it's almost hermetically sealed so every once in a while i need to open it to get you know get some oxygen in before i just pass out from lack of <laughs> oxygen but actually totally surrounding yourself in metal without any gaps that's the way to go um and even if you're like me i work on my um, laptop for hours and hours on end so if i can just be protected for the 16 hours that i'm sometimes working then you know that's a good thing but also i mean you mentioned reflectix and here in europe we have mm -hmm. also this thing which is like insulation material you put behind the um heaters to reflect the heating back and actually mm -hmm. the, what works with reflectix and also on this stuff is actually this aluminium coating it's the same thing as that thing right. i i use baking foil because the aluminium happens to be so thick but um reflectix i think is even thicker because it has to be um bendy so it's super super effective and um there are so many disinfo agents who basically hit the shriekometer as soon as you say oh just use aluminium foil and they dig out the old tin foil business but you have to think the other way around you have to think hang on why did the cia put so much effort into spreading the expression tin foil hat Throughout the entire world. Oh yes, that's that's a bad thief of mine as well. You know, it's like conspiracy theorists and connecting the two. Exactly, them. and then you have to do a system judo on that and think. Hang on a second, tin foil hat. Where does it come from? Oh yes, it comes from the fifties and sixties where there was still tin in this foil. There's no tin in it anymore. So tin foil hat. Hmm, that's an ancient expression. And that was exactly the time when the CIA started to run experiments where they did shoot people in the mm -hmm. head. And actually, oh, I should bring it up the other day. Uh, That's how the CIA got started, you know, with the National Security Act being established in 1947. And all Absolutely. these horrific MKUltra experiments started right there, you know, in the 50s. Exactly. And unfortunately, I've, I've already shut it down, but I had a link to the CIA, the old MK Ultra CIA documents. And one of the things I noticed in there, and this is the, the stuff that was declassified, you know, after the Church Commission. And um, the CIA documents mention MKUltra and projects for psychosurgery. Psychosurgery, what does that mean? That's brain surgery. That's brain, mm -hmm. remote controlled brain surgery. So they are hitting us in the head, trying to dumb us down and make us forget things by literally cupping the synapses, I think. Mm -hmm. And you know, something else that must be remembered also, it's right around that time, 1952, 1953, that the DSM, I think, came into being. Yes. The whole, and the whole connection with psychiatry. So you see, I think the CIA and psychiatry have been working hand in glove right from the get-go, right from the beginning. I think so. And that can be traced, traced back to the ideologies propelled uh, forward by the Tavistock Institute and the eugenicists. Yes, I think you hit, you know, it's right at the core. I and, think and that's... And the behavioral control and social control of populations, you know. So exactly. all of that sort of worked hand in hand and brings us to the present day where psychiatry is now used as a weapon. It is an absolute weapon that the state yeah. is using. And there are people in hospitals who are working as part of that, as you know, as we saw in the Rasmi Hospital with, with Melanie's baby. Oh, yes. Actually, in terms of, um, I, I've got actually still a couple of things to say about hospitals. Good good job you mention it. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. What also comes to my mind before I launch into that is what um, Dr. Paul Marco said, and he um, drew our attention to, the, to how the DSM was changed and now how things have been, um, you know, turned into illnesses that are not really illnesses and other things mm -hmm. that were actually mental illnesses and, and the real perversions are now mm -hmm. considered just a preference. For example, pedophilia. You know, so you can see the DSM do the CIA or the cartel propaganda and think, oh, pedophilia, that's not bad, is it? It's just a preference. And actually, other things that are totally normal are just weird, yeah, and terrible also, mental illnesses. Yeah, so think about the, the absolutely crazy disorders that are now considered, the, the so-called disorders that have been created by the DSM, you know, things like oppositional defiant disorder. <laughs> Smart young teenagers who are speaking back to their moms and dads. Now they're oppositionally defiant. There's the ADHDs, of course. And, you know, we are living in a society where we are brainwashed to thinking that ADHD is, you know, an actual disorder, um, hyperactivity and so on and so forth. When actually it's just um, um, little toddlers and little children filled with the joy of life, you know, filled with energy. Yeah. And this is why we've got the whole vaccination scenario as well. Then. You know, let's take away their immune systems. Let's suppress their energy and vitality before they get anywhere. So apparently there's something called a delayed sleep disorder. So people who stay up at night, have insomnia, things like that, which also can be induced with radiation weaponry. 
now have delayed sleep disorder to look forward to. So they can be diagnosed with that and uh, drugged with that. So we're living actually in the middle of a kind of a medical techno tyranny that's been established with, um, with medicine and psychiatry at its core. That's the situation facing all of our societies today. I, I think that's it. And we have to, I think, wake up to the fact that um, the intelligence agencies have been just proliferating and expanding and then putting their tes uh, te tentacles into all the testicles. I wanted to say that, sorry. <laughs> I'm already thinking a step ahead. I'm going to get you guys, so hence the, you know, slip up their tentacles into um, the hospitals. And um, I think this is why hospital these days are actually intel warfare outfits. And, and psychiatry units, they are not medical outfits, they are internment camps. That's how we have to think mm -hmm. about them. And they are using the pseudoscience of, of psychiatry to do that. The other thing I want to say about doctors, um, this will sound a bit snooty, but I think it's a, you know, we should um, bring a good, healthy uh, dose of skepticism to the entire medical field for the simple reason that the vast mm -hmm. majority of doctors who I, I know and have worked with, um, also professionally, Ah, uh, they're not very good. And actually, it's it's inherent in the medical profession because the, the reality is, and this was a big issue in Oxford, by the way, the reality is that doctors are taught to learn stuff off by heart. They learn by road. Yes. They have mm -hmm. not the ability for critical thinking. And this is clear as day if you come from the physics um, uh, and maths um, side of things where you are forced to derive and prove absolutely everything. So in physics, if we haven't proved it ourselves and actually derived it ourselves, we don't trust it. So we are trained to just try to derive everything from fundamental principles and understand it ourselves. Doctors, on the other hand, they're just, as long as it's in a textbook somewhere, they're going to lap up anything. And they don't have mm -hmm. the scientific and the mathematical means to actually um, try to check the validity of something themselves. And yet, because the profession is, it comes with inherent power over others, they have this immense arrogance, like breathtaking arrogance and potential for real sadism and psychopathy to be lived out. So I hit this really head on when I changed from particle physics, where, you know, in my collaboration at CERN was like 3,000 super con confrontational, you know, people who want to understood, understand everything from fundamental principles up by themselves. And then I went into medical physics where the engineers I worked with, they would kind of, they had to understand it because they were building stuff. But when we interfaced with the medical doctors, it was like, oh my God, we hit this, we hit the special class. These people knew nothing, but they were so breathtakingly arrogant. It was, mm -hmm. it was an uphill struggle and they couldn't do basic maths. They didn't know basic statistics. And when you read the what so-called scientific articles out of the medical profession, it put tears into my eyes because these people don't understand fundamental statistics. They just don't. And a lot of the stuff that they're pumping out is frankly utter junk. But this is exactly where Intel moved in. And I think there's a class of people who are working in weapons research and they really know what's going on. And they can co-opt these like pseudoscientific psychiatrists and, you know, sometimes semi, semi scientifically literate medical doctors and literally lead them up the garden path, you know? And I it think is. And you know, I think as, as you say, I think it's set up to do that. They've set it up to do that. Because if you think about psychiatry, for instance, in the Western medical paradigm, and psychiatry is part of the Western medical paradigm, you know, if you look at what they are studying, they are literally studying pharmacology. They are studying about drugs and they're studying about drug dosages. That's what they're good at. They're good at drug dosages. But they, but they are um, bringing forth or giving out these drug dosages based on very faulty premises. You know, they look at people, they jump to all the wrong conclusions all the time because they've taken that attitude, that sort of top down behavioral management attitude of deciding to sit in judgment over people and uh, be authoritarian, uh, which is another way of being totalitarian, really, because that or establishing totalitarianism for, for the state, for the agencies. Um, and that seems to be what's going on. So psychiatrists and the agencies are working hand in hand, as you say, and I think they've been working hand in hand for a very long time. And perhaps there are psychiatrists who are not part of it, who are not part of the cabal, not part of the cartel. But because the system itself is set up to permit it, they're inevitably going to express 
the cartel's authoritarianism. Because what they are doing is they're sitting in judgment, they're pronouncing people as having disorders that need to be addressed with psychotic, antipsychotic drugs, neuroleptic drugs, which ultimately destroy the brain. And you see, that's the ultimate irony. These terrible drugs actually destroy the brain. So they pretend to be brain, or they pretend to be concerned about people's brains and about people's mental health and mental makeup and psychological makeup. And ultimately, what are they doing? They are using these terrible pharmacological weapons of drugs, deadly drugs, deadly neuroleptic and antipsychotic drugs, um, to literally wipe out people's brains. So this is how I think, if you look across, there are many people, I think, who are aware of this and in different fields, people working with adolescents, people working with um, minor drug def uh, offenders, you know, who end up in our incarcerated in our jails, etc., who are aware that psychiatry is being used in these highly pernicious ways. You know, and I think that's something as we've talked about actually needing to do a bit more of an investigation on. I certainly need to, I need to read that and I need to research it a little bit, but I definitely want to plow in and um, attack this a little bit because um, I think we need to, uh, to, to make it clear to people that doctors and psychiatrists are not who they are presenting themselves to be. And actually on that note, you know, because we were talking a little bit about hospitals, I think one of the things I wanted to say about my hospital experience just recently, last week, is that um, I felt the doctors that I was coming in contact with were very kind of within the box. They had no, they didn't appear to have any awareness of what's really going on currently. They didn't have any awareness of surveillance views. They didn't have any awareness of microwave weapons or anything. So nobody actually asked me, so do you think this happened with, um, you know, was this radiation? Was this a radiation weapon? Nobody mentioned that. Nobody or seemed to have any awareness. And of course, I didn't mention it either. So, but I got the impression that these doctors are very, very sheltered in a way. They're very, they're very uninformed. They're just uninformed. So possibly, and you know, I've been talking with Dr. Ed Spencer about this a little bit. Possibly there is an opportunity here to begin to educate doctors about what is going on because they should be aware that people can walk in with radiation injuries. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly it. And um, one of the things that we will launch into over the um, coming weeks and months is exactly an information campaign to um, to inform these people because it's true. Some doctors are genuinely um, uninformed. And um, mm -hmm. I would like to also, um, I, actually, before I forget, just on the topic of psychiatry, sorry, this is now a note to all the um, German viewers this is a German reference, but because I also I'm here in Switzerland and I'm representing, you know, the Swiss effort, I encourage people to watch the videos. Um, there are um, three videos I strongly recommend. One of them is uh, Dr. Regina Merkley. She is a forensic psychiatrist who has worked as forensic psychiatry for a very long time. And she is talking about how forensic psychiatry has become mad. <laughs> it has become insane. Um, that's one thing. And here's one person who actually became the victim of forensic psychiatry. And for those people who um, speak German, I recommend these three videos. So one of them is called uh, Die Forensische Psychiatrie ist irrsinnig geworden. So um, Teil 1 und 2. And uh, Das Brachiale Geschäft der Forensik, eine unheilige Allianz zwischen Polizei und Psychiatrie. So what this video is about, actually this guy is very interesting because he points out that um, psych psychiatry um, and and um, when when people get locked up by the police and taken to psychiatry, that's the only place where you know they come out worse than before they saw the doctors. So how can that be? So what's going on with psychiatry? That if you you go in um, apparently mentally ill and you come out worse, how can that yeah. be? And, and we've got all these fantastic examples like Melanie Richan. She was falsely uh, um, imprisoned in psychiatry by Hospital Erasmus, and I have to say. Every single psychiatrist that I've seen there, Dr. Ari, Dr. Delhai, Do, uh, Dr. S uh, Maya Sombot, Frederick Milson, these people were criminally incompetent. They were so fucking dumb and couldn't do their job that they couldn't pick up a healthy person. And with that, they're not, not, not doctors, they're criminals. These people need to be sacked. And she, you know, with Melanie, she was given drugs and she was worse off. She was shaking, she couldn't make sense, she was totally in a cloud and dizzy. Well, that's not medication, that's poisoning. Mm -hmm. And the same, exactly the same thing repeated with Frederick, um, sorry, with uh, Frederick Laroche in France, 
where he was taken into the psychiatric hospital and he was uh, medicated, again, poisoned, mm -hmm. such that his breathing was paralyzed <clears throat> and he couldn't breathe mm -hmm. for a day. And that's poisoning. These people are criminally incompetent. If you go in and your doctor makes you feel worse, he's violating the, uh, the Hippocratic oath, you know, first, don't do any harm, right? And mm -hmm. second of all, he's criminally incompetent. So these people need to be taken to task. So that much about, um, about psychiatry, but I wanted to say um, a couple of things that actually still about your experience um, in the hospital, because one of the things you said, and that we should like, you know, we should perk up and, and listen to that carefully, how they wanted to have a blood sample. I mean, this odd mm -hmm. sequence that you've got a burn in your ring finger and this is your ring finger. Now, have you ever heard about domestic violence where husband just beats <laughs> her ring finger? Like, I haven't, it would be really no, I, weird. Exactly, I you thought know. it was completely bizarre. Because yeah. if I did have, you know, kind of a violent husband at home, Surely they'd look at my face for some evidence yeah. of this assault. Exactly. Know? Like, you know, bits of him under your fingernails, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, so domestic violence, you know, to do with the ring finger. Okay, so that's nonsense. And then this thing, do you feel safe in the house? I'm sorry. If we think about these hospitals, especially in the Boston area, being, you know, outfits of the CIA and this entire intel warfare and um, studying people, then it makes perfect sense because they want to, they set up the, the entire slip road of first really damaging your fingers so that you have to go to hospital. Or when you're in hospital, kind of help you along to say, oh no, I don't feel safe because I'm hit by millimeter wave weapons, you know? And then they can think, oh, we have no idea what that is. We've never heard about it. Like yes, hospital and in fact, she asked me that again at the end, towards the end of the whole evening when I was almost ready to get out of there, she asked me that again, do you feel safe at home? And I'm sitting there thinking, now, I could actually say I, I am not safe at home. I'm being assaulted with radiation weapons. And then I began to realize, yeah, that's exactly what they want you to say. Yeah. So I shouldn't. <laughs> like, you know, no, I'm, I'm fine. You know, I'm fine. Official, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the I'm real reality is, you You know, you've got the CIA warfare, you know, outfit. You're like a battlefield at home, but I'm safe. I'm, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. And that's exactly what they wanted to do because they set it all up. And look at how Erasmus, um, uh, Hospital Erasmus in Brussels, you know, put Melanie into psychiatry because I said that she had a throat implant because I had analyzed myself, the other part that was taken out in a Swiss lab and found it to be, you know, synthetic. So I say that and they put Melanie into psychiatry and then they pretend like, oh, we've never heard about implants. And at the same time, the same day, they put out a press release about their newest implants for diabetics that's monitoring your blood sugar right. level, everything. It's like a multi-sensor little Uber chip that they are just advertising. But you know, and you know, Catherine, the, the, uh, the tragedy and the extre extremity really of the situation with Melanie's baby is that based on that, that supposed ignorance about implants, they have now completely, quote unquote, confiscated her baby. Her baby is in the care now, in the neonatology unit. They are acting as if, you know, the neonatology unit is a better place for that baby to be than in Melanie's care, in her home, in her loving arms at home. They are, and despite the fact that they had the court hearing where their judge found her to be absolutely free of mental illness or whatever kind, and um, these people for having jumped to conclusions, um, they, they've gotten right back to it. On the basis of that ignorance, they have completely taken her over, taken her, her life over and her child over. Actually, I think it's much more than that. Um, you know what? Because um, I've been so, the saga with Melanie is still ongoing. Some very, very interesting developments have been happening. But the bottom line is that over months after taking her baby away, um, they still haven't given the baby back. Melanie was not allowed to breastfeed the baby. Mm -hmm. Right. There was even more sabotage, which I don't want to, you know, discuss here because it's private details, but really intrusive break-ins and sabotage of this entire thing um, mm -hmm. in her home. So Belgian intelligence, I, I swear, has got the biggest court case on the ass. If I, you know, if I, they, they have to kill me and absolutely everybody I told about this to stop this now. But these people are a bunch of fucking Nazis because they taken a baby away from a woman and have sabotaged the mother-child relationship in every psychopathic serial killer way they could possibly dream up. So these people they, have it coming. 
but they've completely traumatized both the mother and the child exactly in, in those very critical early days of bonding they have completely traumatized that baby that is the right keyword the that is the right keyword trauma i think they're doing mk ultra at the hospital it I is think totally mk ultra it is i think trauma-based mind control and now i would like to make um something uh, i would like to show you something i would like to share my screen and show you the people who work at the neonatal unit in um hospital erasmus because i think these people i'm not sure if they're freemasons i would suspect they are but they most certainly work for the cartel to the best of my knowledge based on what i've seen because the things i've seen are so irregular and so crazy and so malicious and brutal, I have come to the conclusion that Professor Bart van Overmeyer, or whatever he's called, the guy who runs neon um, uh, the neonatal unit, I think he is involved in trauma-based mind control. I think the baby, Melanie's baby, is being traumatized. And um, there were nurses who pointed out to Melanie that her baby has gone very quiet. Now, that's a natural reaction to trauma in babies. They go quiet because they don't want to attract attention to them as, a, as, a, as an instinct for survival. Now, this guy, if I can help it, this guy has to lose his job for what has happened in the neonatal unit. And another thing that's very interesting is that um, as I was standing there in front of the neonatal unit with um, Melanie's father, we were trying to just allow the, the grandfather of this child to see the baby once. They wouldn't allow it for maximum sadism because they're a bunch of fucking criminals in my view. But as I was talking to this um, you know, so-called pediatrician who apparently has the best interest of the child in mind, remember, Melanie's father has, doesn't have any violent offenses, he's a loving and caring grandfather, and he was not even given permission to see the baby. Very odd. So we're standing outside and we're discussing with the pediatrician why that's the case. Why can't, why can't he see the baby? And um, she just blocked it. And then she said, oh, don't, you know, there's a very telltale sign, um, you know, a, a sentence that will stick with me because she just laughed. And that's another thing about the people at Hospital Erasmus. They laugh you in the face. That's very telling. It, to me, it smacks of a very sleek operation and everybody has such over self-confidence that they think that they can get away with everything. So she laughs me in the face, looks at me and says, why are you so upset? It's not the first time this happens that the baby gets taken away from the mother. And I looked at it and I was like, oh, really? Really? I was thinking, thank you. Thank you for telling huge. me because this is, this is huge. This means that there are scores of women to, to whom these people have done it and they don't understand network mathematics. They don't know that we will find these people quicker than they like and we will bring these people down because i'm convinced that what's being set up there is child trauma i also believe that the neonatal unit is this is my personal belief i think um the baby should be implanted as karen said possibly implanted even in the bone structure that you can't do when the bone has actually solidified and i think they want to set up babies to be controlled by birth and let's remember what um dr melissa black says um Randall Webster, this Air Force psychopathic serial killer who was torturing her and talking nonstop to her by her illegal ear chip, he is gloating about how he controlled her granddaughter since birth. Since birth, how would an intel agent or military dude control a child by, by birth, since birth? Through chipping. I think this is it. And these people have given the game away. So I personally think that these people have it coming. But the, the other um, people I would like to point out are the psychiatrists at Hospital Erasmus, because the psychiatric unit is an internment camp. I have not seen a single person who behaved competently. Um, I think these people really have a criminal operation running. And in my books, this guy reading this, the leading this, is really doing something highly odd and very criminal in this place and another thing i would like to point out is that a while back i have made uh, a youtube video about how to recognize psychopaths so i you know i made youtube videos in the beginning about systems analysis and what what the problems are and one of them was about how to recognize psychopaths psychopaths and systems and i said and this was months and months ago before i went into hospital erasmus i said the way to tell that there's some senior psychopaths somewhere high up there are some telltale t t um, signs because psychopaths love control and they love their ego so control ego if it's a male psychopath then 
control will be also um, displayed or and, and his ego displayed over basically dominance displays. And one of them, because these people I think are only into like sex and killing um, because their minds reduced. Um, one of the things that they do is that they will have these like um, uh, what trophy, what you know, women around themselves so literally like these kind of like flashy bitches as i call them you know but who basically have certain assets but not much brain so when you go for example into a corporation and you've got you know the the receptionist and everybody you know mostly female looking like um star models you know that there must be a senior psychopath because you are walking through a controlled environment that's entirely geared towards male dominance displays like these are my bitches here check them out so and that is exactly the feeling that melanie and i had in hospital erasmus so this is a very touchy topic but as a as somebody who worked at cern and at oxford it is not normal when you go into a place that should actually be academic and geared towards scientific endeavor and all women are strangely you know shifted the distribution has shifted to the model physiognomy and other assets right further down and at the same time, they seem to be totally vacuous in the head. You know, that to me smacks off a big fat cycle being hidden somewhere in the institution. And if I'm at this organization, it must be the, I would put my money onto the head of the neonatal unit and the head of psychiatry, both of them being one big fat psychopath. Um, and I think that has to be taken into account because in one fell swoop, it would explain a lot of things. I think Intel has been infiltrating hospitals, putting their people in, which, you know, predominantly seem to be ruthless psychopaths, um, keeping other people who are maybe academically much better away from those jobs, planting these people in, then these people are, giving their little, are given their little kingdom and can accumulate their, you know, prize women, but they have to do the bidding of the Intel agencies. And um, it was at some point that I remarked to Melanie when we were in psychiatry, I was like, where do all these dolls come from? You know, everybody was so dolled up, but at the same time in the cerebral department, rather, you know, uh, needing, you know, further input. I was thinking, how do they end up here exactly? You know, it's all these really young women, all of, of we, Melanie and I even laughed about this in, in our psychiatry because they all seem to be almost carbon copies of the same, you know, sort of look. I was like, hmm, could it be that a man who does the hiring has selected them based on his preference? You know, and, and now I'm talking to Melanie and she's um, dealing with the people in the neonatal unit. And she's like, it's again a parade of little dolls. So I was like, OK, so and we have to take this seriously because um, a normal population does not look like that. You know, when, when we selected people and I did um, admissions for Oxford, you know, several years in a row, when we selected people and we wanted the best and brightest, with the women, you don't get these, you know, the parade of models. In fact, you get everything but because women who are who pride themselves with their brains can't be enough to just doll themselves up for somebody, you know. So that was also a very big telltale sign. And then the way, so you have to put all this in circumstantial evidence, the way they behave. And I think hospital Erasmus is a totally controlled environment. And what you say to me about um, this other hospital in Boston, it makes total sense. You know, and how, oh, one last thing, you know, the blood sample that they wanted to take from you. Big thing. I want to briefly point people to um, the mm -hmm. interview just very quickly. The interview here, if you go, guys, go to Covert Rassman Conference 2015 and then under speakers, go to Carl Clark, who is the XMI6 agent who blew the whistle um after he fought he's fallen out with his employer so you can actually listen to his video testimony here a very important for court cases at the bottom of the page you can see his interview and in german in german and in english um about what actually happened and this is an interview that was published um in a german uh, magazine called raum und zeit and this is the original article about how he blew the whistle about secret surveillance and radiation torture of the intelligence agencies and he worked for the intelligence agencies he worked for mi6 and mossad and a host of others and here's the he's interview a prime, he's a primary witness and whistleblower he's definitely he is and then the second link is actually the entire thing translated into english so i would recommend that people uh, print this off and take it to their um to their court cases but one of the things that he says somewhere um actually let me just um search for this 
um, yes, here. Um, he says um, that the very first thing was that, um, uh, hang on, yes, here, this one. So Carl Clark says, I saw that what I was doing was wrong. The last two targets that were allocated to me had nothing. They were not political, quite normal, nice people, not criminal or economically dangerous. Economically dangerous, as if that would be a reason to survey somebody. No, that's incredible. Um, but then it comes and, and he says, the only reason I could come up with for them having been selected as targets was their DNA or their blood. There has recently been a lot of research done in this area. The DNA is associated with the, first, uh, with the finest details of our character. The Human mm. Genomes Project between mm. 1993 and 2004 analyzed all chemical base pairs which make up human DNA, also collecting um, the genetic data of people from isolated communities in danger of extinction. Yeah, as if they mm -hmm. cared. The results were then all compared and correlated. Our And this is now the bombshell. Our employers, as in the intelligence agencies, were always very keen on DNA analysis of the people under surveillance. It was always one of our most important tasks in the initial period of surveillance to organize DNA or blood analyses of these individuals. Isn't that interesting? So, so there we are, right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. So when these people, you go in with just, you know, uh, a blister on your finger and they mm -hmm. want to have a blood analysis, you think, hmm, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, but, you know, they've already got their blood analysis from me from uh, my early period of surveillance way yeah. back in time when I did indeed go to a doctor and I ended up seeing actually um, a couple of psychiatrists without realizing that I was being dragged off to see a psychiatrist. I thought I was seeing a marital counselor because that's what my husband told me, right? Wow. Um, wow. Yeah, that's another big story in itself. Um, betrayal by family members. And um, then uh, they took blood from me that time because they decided to test my blood because my husband was acting like my guardian and keeper at that point in time. Uh, it was a sort of a rot situation, a rot circumstance. It was such a nightmare. And then um, they took my blood. And I remember when I, was when, they, when I gave blood that day, there was a blood that were taken, three. And also, as I was sitting outside, shortly after giving blood, uh, waiting for some paperwork or something, somebody came in, a young woman, accompanied by two Indian people. Okay, so I'm Indian. I'm from India, right? So um, young Indian man, young Indian woman, and as people may know, this, this country is flooded with people from India working in the field of biotech and in the field of molecular biology, in the field of medicine. That's big in India to, you know, to work in those fields and uh, to come here, to come to the States and to come to the UK and, and continue working in those fields. So, so there you have the Indian researchers, and then the. So, what, what did I actually witness at that moment? I wonder, was that a CIA researcher with a couple of other DOD Indian researchers, DOD funded Indian researchers, coming in to take a vial of my blood? And they, they were looking at me. So, you see, what happened was they came by, and the woman, young woman, the young American woman, said something to these two. Um, Indian people, and they both, they all turned around and they looked at me very deliberately, almost like, it's her blood, we're taking her blood, and we're going, you know, so it, it's sort of, you know, it's another one of those things that you see that, that um, you don't have a complete explanation for, but that you simply have a little bit of intuition there. That's a very interesting point because the other thing that also these hospitals are doing because because of the utter unbridled arrogance of these dim-witted doctors is they think if you go in a hospital, they own you and they're these guards yeah. and you're, you're a patient. And that's actually, you know, what's another thing that's very interesting because we have to remember that the crime cartel and the intel agencies, they are two things. They are death cult and a sex cult. So everything that they do is just infused with sex and death, sex and death, sex killing, fucking killing. It's, it's like the same stuff over and over. We see it in our targeting, but also, and this is another really, you know, unsavory topic, but in everything that they do, sexual perversions are part of it. And one of the things that I noticed, and from all the stories that victims tell me about that, oh, you know, they start, um, you know, they start messaging me that I'm a patient or that I should go to hospital or that I'm this or that, all to do with being a patient. And what mm -hmm. I, in a lot of these things, it's clear when you see individual details, is to me, it's also, they get off on these doctor sex games. They literally get off on the power over somebody else. 
and it's kind of sadistic hurt, hurting somebody else. So that's, I think, also a strong driving element. But the other thing is also that by taking the power over the patient, they think just because you went into hospital and became a patient, which let's face it, we should be called customers. We are customers mm -hmm. because we're going there for service, you know? So because they were class patients, they can do whatever they like. And, oh, we decide what's good for you. So we'll take from you whatever we mm -hmm. want. And they use this That's doctor exactly arrogance the to then pump it all into bio research, into weapons research, and open the back door to these criminal thugs and serial killers, you mm -hmm. know? I, I think this is hugely worrying that they just go past it people is. and just, you know, they, take they blood. Do. They do. And so there's no, um, th this notion of privacy, which I know there's a big deal in the U.S. about the HIPAA Act and, you know, everybody goes, goes to hospitals or to doctors and gets informed that, you know, your medical records are confidential. We're not going to share them with anybody. Can you just sign here? And then the next thing you know, somebody's coming in from the back rooms and taking your medical records and wallets and all. And um, various people have told me st horror stories, you know, people have been targeted, that is, you know, that they've actually seen a doctor being pushed back in his chair and the records being taken and what and the, and you know uh, when this particular person who is being targeted went into a clinic she actually wow. saw her information being taken away in that fashion it's so, very interesting because oh gosh just just the one footnote when i was in munich again bnd you know um, nazi psychopaths um, I was given um, an artificial heart pain. I'd never had problems with my heart and it disappeared the day I went to the cardiologist. Um, but um, again, you know, the cardiologist did, did all sorts of tests and it was all fine, but he also took blood because he wanted to um, um, test two markers in the blood. And then when I came back, there was only one of these markers actually certified. And I said, what happened to the second test, the second vial of blood? He said, oh, don't worry about it. It's not important. You know, ignore, ignore, ignore. And then I turned around and in the waiting room, he was super nervous. And by the time, you know, I went to the reception to pick up my results. When I came, he shot out from a room next door, you know, uber busybodying, like, okay, okay, I'll deal with this. I'll deal with this. And then he said to me, oh, don't worry about it. It's fine. You're, it's all fine. You're all healthy and forget it, forget it. And I looked at him. I thought he was so nervous. He was pinching mm -hmm. his own arm. He didn't even notice. I was like, that's very interesting. And I just turned around and behind me was somebody I can only describe as an angry little dwarf. It was this like older guy, like a pensioner, who was just standing there glaring at my doctor in the middle of the room. And I thought, ooh, you know, is there something going on here? And I think this is exactly the intimidation I saw. You know? Yes, and it's intimidation, exactly. And I think that's what it is. These intel agencies are everywhere they're in our hospitals you know they're in the clinics is intimidation and takeover you know the other thing i just remembered ramola thinking about it i'm just going to look up the link because do you remember the testimony of udo of cotter so yeah. udo of cotter appeared on um and blew the whistle on rt and in many other places about um Basically, the CIA, the CIA. In, inside media rooms and journal, journalistic news, newsrooms and press rooms, and basically that. Exactly, exactly. And what's super important? Let me just share my screen because I now vaguely remembered a very important sentence, and it just clicked into place. So, if you search for Udo of Cotter, you will see this. These are the RT videos, and it's one of these RT videos. Try to click the the longest one and um try to sorry this is adverts um and it's it's this rt video where you can see him with this background i'm pretty sure and somewhere in this interview he is talking about the fact that he has heard from um a guy who works for um the air ambulance and in germany there's a, a big road rescue um association that by the way has more members than any political party you know i think they've got 40 million members or something stupid like that you know um mm -hmm. so the adac in germany is big they have rescue helicopters big yellow rescue rescue helicopters you know they've got rescue planes they bring you back even if you you know had a car accident somewhere in africa and you're you know injured so they are massive but he said that um, he was approached by somebody who was a rescue pilot for the mm -hmm. ADAC. And then this rescue pilot was approached by the BND and the so German Intel, and they asked him to work for them. 
And he said no. And then they sacked him. So he lost his job because he refused to work as a res uh, rescue helicopter medic, I think medic or pilot, I can't remember. He refused to work for the BND. And I was thinking, what is the possible point of infiltrating rescue helicopters with BND agents? Hmm. I mean, of course, it could be like, oh, we run surveillance and then you're up in the sky watching. I'm like, no, it's if you want to finish somebody off by staging a car accident and you don't quite succeed, you can finish them off in the rescue helicopter. I think but that's you know, rem But remember on the rescue helicopter now, was he asked to be a pilot, a rescue helicopter pilot? I, I, I think he was a medic. I think he was a medic. As, or as a check. medic, as a medic. Yeah. Because see, if you're looking at the issue of medics, think about it. These medics and the whole rescue scenario, they're, they're EMS personnel, right? And who but EMS personnel who offer frontline to to people, to the to the population, to the civilian civilian population, who could better implant or under the guise of taking blood, interact with that person, you know, exactly. un under the guise of beneficence and benefaction, actually engage in malefaction. Exactly. Maleficent endeavor. And, and didn't Millicent also say that was it an FBI agent or was it a police officer who told her uh, I yes, have to look at that. A police officer. A police it officer who told her. Yeah, yeah who, t who told her you get implanted or people get implanted if they've got car accidents. If they have car accidents, yeah, people get implanted when they're taken to hospital, the chips are put in them from accidents. You know, because people in accidents, obviously, you can imagine that some of them may not be in a state of um, consciousness. So. As, so their bodies are right there, and they're, they're being taken, and they're being chipped oh, for goodness. these dastardly covert clandestine experiments. So you see, something that all of us, those of us who have been, who are being hit with surveillance abuse currently, have gotten um, an insight into is the world of clandestine operations, is the world of covert testing operations, weapons testing operations, and covert um, experimentation operations which are indeed going on and this is why we can say completely unequivocally that these operations are going on yes absolutely and and just to understand for people to understand the scale of it let me just share my screen one, once more because i would like to draw attention to the case of dr ronnie kilder so dr mm -hmm. ronnie kilder was the um chief medical officer for finland and um her, her friend and colleague um uh, henning witter put up this uh, news article on his uh, YTV um, 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 news channel. So the link is ytv.se. And um, if you just um, search for Dr. Ronnie um, Kilder uh, murdered, you will get this. <coughs> Forgive me. But um, what is very important is that Henning Witter was one of those people who received an email after Dr. Ronnie Kilder was attacked with directed energy weapons so brutally that she had to be taken to hospital. So what I heard was that um, a Dr. Kilder was literally on the floor of her home in absolute agony being um, irradiated. Um, and then she had to be taken to hospital. They refused to take her to the Norwegian hospital where she wanted to go and took her to another place. And then there she was brutally abused in the hospital by doctors. And this, I just would like to draw attention to it because it already has a lot of, um, um, you know, uh, details that we need to know. This is the sort of stuff that can happen when you've got intel agents already embedded and infiltrated in the hospitals. So she says, I was badly attacked 17th to 18th December with psychotronic weapons laying at the floor with extreme pain until after midnight. I had to call an ambulance um, 19th to go to hospital while malpractice started from, from the first minute. A male doctor hit my right kidney so hard that my urine was bloody the next day. For three days, a female doctor did not touch me at all. I had said it all comes from beaming. She said, uh, no one will believe you. I said, insiders do. Even my heart was not listened to. Um, she stood two to three meters away from me all three days until I said I want to go home. By the way, if a doctor keeps standing two to three meters away from you, it could be because you've been contaminated with either some bio-warfare weapon 
or with some substance, a chemical or radioactive material, heck knows. But it's very telling that Dr. Onikil, before her death, reported that the doctor stood several meters away from her. All right. And she said she wanted to go home. Um, and I did have a serious illness now, which they have caused with radiation. And it was now activated. So there are certain viruses that can be activated with electromagnetic radiation. So it seems like Dr. Oni Kilda was suspecting that. Um, after some bed rest, I got assistance to travel with, with a wheelchair to Finland, where I will have all tests redone. F Finland is not a NATO country having to follow U.S. orders. And it is right now much better for me to be here and go to the hospital here. So Dr. Onikilda was taken to a hospital where I think a cousin of hers worked. Um, so she was, she was there. And then um, she says, in addition, my old cat disappeared. And at night, I got a flash vision. They hit and smashed her skull with some wooden planks. So what Dr. Onikilda is talking about, the synthetic telepathy, it's the sending of video footage and images. So she was clearly, you know, hooked up here to synthetic telepathy. And then she said, even if they tried to eliminate me by, oh, yes. And then she says, even they tried to eliminate me by giving two times an injection um, I was a, 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 allergic to, I will survive. Um, so mm -hmm. what she means by that, sorry, I just heard some background noise, so I had to just check. But what she's talking about is that she was given two injections of morphine, uh, morphium or morphine, even though she's allergic to it. And she made that very clear. Um, and she said, please do not spread the word. But if, uh, if you know any healers, I would appreciate to get their help because I try to get better only with alternative methods. Um, and if it would succeed, it would be a medical miracle showing the power of thought and healing. Um, so love and light, Ronnie. Now, she didn't want to make it um, public um, as she was being attacked. And, and then it was made public afterwards. The reason why she didn't want it to be made public was because she didn't want people to be intimidated. So she didn't want these horrific attacks against her to be spread so that other people are being silenced. Now, what many people don't know is that, um, and this is something I got to know from Melanie Richan, actually, because she worked with um, Dr. Ronnie Kilder quite closely. And uh, Melanie told me that when uh, Dr. Kilder was murdered, she was um, about to work really closely with the EU to have the stuff banned. So um, Dr. Ronnie Kilder was very highly regarded. Um, because she'd been a doctor for over 30 years. She was respected by both the military as much as civilian politicians. And she was working closely with the EU and she was murdered, basically. And then all these attempts to have this um, entire horrific crime program um, shut down came to a grinding halt. So I think what we learned from that is the, the best thing to do is the total opposite. When you're being attacked and you're, you're doing something important, you have to let the entire world know and the entire world has to be right behind you straight away. And I think what this shows us is, is um, several things. Number one, it, it's a prime example how the intelligence agencies have already set up their agents in hospitals. So when you go to hospital, when a target goes to hospital, they probably quickly rotate the doctors. Maybe the other doctors are totally oblivious. They are being called off to something super urgent, right? And then somebody else will take your case. And if you happen to chance on a doctor who is a total asshole and it does something, you know, untoward, then you have to, you have to make that public because we need to eliminate these agents from our hospitals, you know. Um, and that's one thing. The second thing is it's it's not a surprise that we're being attacked. It happened to uh, Dr. Kilda. It happened to you, Ramola. It happened to me, to Melanie. It's like a staple. You know, the medical industry has been entirely infiltrated and subverted by these agents. Yes, I think that's unfortunately true. And I think also that the, the use of psychiatry has become a staple. They, they've established it now as a kind of a go-to means of trapping targets, trapping people who are going in with radiation injuries. People who go in for migraines are suddenly being dragged off to psychiatric wards just because they mentioned that they're being hit, with, that they're being hit with radiation weaponry. So in other words, they're closing off all means that victims could possibly have in any society to get help. So victims trying to get help from doctors are being written off by psychiatrists as delusional. And this is the great uh, success, I think, of the intelligence um, psychiatry equation there, 
because the, the intelligence agencies and the military, I think the military is also part of it, and we're talking about the DOD, we're talking about the USAF, we're talking about DARPA. These are the military groups that are working with psychiatrists to ensure that their victims, that their um, test subjects are completely kept as test subjects. In other words, they are, they are, they've set up this pipeline, they've set up the scenario to, as um, Karen brilliantly put it, to promote access to the victims so that um, the abusers, that is the, the researchers, the clandestine researchers who are abusing people's bodies with radiation weaponry and with psychotronic weaponry and with neuro weaponry, so that these abusers will have continued access to the, to the victims. By cutting off any recourse for the victims, cutting off any ways in which these victims can get help from the larger public to say, look, I'm being assaulted in my own home, please help me. So law enforcement says, no, we won't investigate. Media says, no, we're not gonna cover it. We're not gonna listen. We're reporters with fabulous names and fabulous paychecks and we're attached to big companies and press uh, organizations like the Washington Post and New York Times, but we're not gonna listen. What we're gonna do instead is listen to the psychiatrists and the psychiatrists are in place to call you delusional. So that the reporters from the New York Times will quote those psychiatrists and say, these people are delusional who are coming in to report radiation injuries. I have to say though, re in recent times, I've been speaking to a number of people who are not targeted and whom I'd never met before. I was just introduced to some of these people often over the telephone, in fact, mostly over the telephone. And these are people around the country mention that I'm being hit by nuclear weapons, I'm a victim of surveillance abuse, and not one of them said to me, they completely believed me immediately. Whereas my own family, for instance, who's a doctor and who has a lot of friends who are psychiatrists, stay convinced that I'm delusional. And to this end, right up to this present moment has been sending me emails as, as Catherine, you know, uh, sending me emails trying to convince me that I am and need some deadly psychiatric help right now. I need to hold the hand of wellness. And I'm not being normal with all my organized <laughs> and my shielding. I need to hold the hand of wellness and get normal again because normalcy is so important. Normalcy is good. Oh. I need to become normal. You know what I think I think this is an entire this is a really good um topic for maybe next week because at some point I wanted to um lead the entire discussion onto the next thing which we have to disclose in greatest detail which where you did such a, an amazing work with um Chris Burton the entire mm -hmm. topic of neurotech and the power of neurotech, because all of us have experienced, I, I've experienced my family being properly yes. taken over, like a, two zombies, my parents in front of my own eyes, where I would change position in the room and mm -hmm. they would be shouting at the place where I was before, not their eyes totally overridden by something else. So um, neurotech is, is extremely powerful and we've got more and more people talking about mind control weapons and their power. And um, I think what we have to face up to is because of the power of neurotech and because of um, the way the intelligence agencies seem to work, which is um, they used all the, you know, the stuff that um, Bill Binney and Kirk Weeby blew the whistle on that all these is mass data collection and they are graphing us and they, they kind of can map our entire life and they can predict what we're going to do and they know us better than we, you know, than we do in some places. What they also do is that they do social graphing, so social mapping. And I have certainly seen evidence that, um, our families are taken over and if you've mm -hmm. got parents siblings best friends or whoever you're in close contact with they all have a little um intel operation around them as well so it's much much bigger than we realize and the people who are closest to us are the most neurotech of them all yes and i think that's exactly what i experienced recently with all these people whom i've just met being open to understanding that yes the government is using microwave weapons on americans Exactly. The, US the U.S. government is using microwave weapons on U.S. citizens. Act. You know, that is reality. That is what is going on. And these people around the country are willing and aware enough to understand that. Whereas my own family, who's known me much, much longer, you know, obviously all my, my entire life, 
um, cannot grasp that con con basic concept. And in fact, is absolutely entrenched in this other idea, in this fixate, of this ide fixe, you know, that basically reporting assault by radiation weapons has um, suddenly become schizoid, has suddenly become schizophrenic, has suddenly become delusional. Yeah. And this is so absurd. This is so absurd that the only answer is, as you say, this is mind control. This is most distinctly mind control. My sister, I am convinced it's being neurally influenced, whether it's with a brain chip or with just radio frequencies being sent, yeah. bumped into her brain. I, I don't know what so. it is, but she is. And, and, I, but of course, you know, remember, she's also, a, she's, she's the victim of brainwashing, being, being a medical. Yeah. Working in hospitals. And also she's got psychiatrist uh, friends inside that psychiatry paradigm. Yeah, I think also there's other evidence because you told me that when you were at the house um, in, in the UK, um, you felt in, intense irradiation. And that's, I think, a prime, prime, um, you know, bit of evidence for that. And also my parents' house. I mean, um, they, one of the things that has been, uh, you know, a feature of my life is that I would move somewhere. Somebody would die next door. And then suddenly mm -hmm. I would, somebody would move in and they would start irradiating me. So I personally have a list of potential murders committed around me. But, but the fact is that next to my parents' home, an old lady died. And it was one of those things where, oh, she fell off her bicycle and broke her arm and she was otherwise fine and a total trooper. And then, you know, out of nowhere, boof, she's mentally disintegrating, needs to be put into a home and dies really quickly. Where we all thought, hmm it's not and that's what not mm -hmm. what happened so but then a, a woman moved in and i think a lot of the neurotech weapons and transmitters and, and weapons are placed at that house next to my parents and i have evidence for that for example one of the things i um talked about publicly is that one day my mother called me frantically she tried to get through to me i was actually out the entire day and i didn't hear my mobile phone she sent me dozens of emails and messages and, and i didn't get any of them and i come home and suddenly it's like woof mom messaging me from every digital device i have and i just called and i said what happened and i thought it was <laughs> something really bad happened she's like oh no 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 it's fine can we just talk on skype and i said yeah sure let's get on skype and then she said oh i just had a bad dream and i already you know when i hear this she's like yeah it was really intense and i was like really you had a really intense oh, you know, you, you said it's neurotech yes synthetic definitely. telepathy but you know what happened to mm -hmm. her and, and this is kind of like what i think is being done to our families at that time, what um, German Intel did to her is that they had one of these virtual reality things where they played out an entire film. And if you've ever experienced that, it's like you're in a movie, but it's like high def. It's like Hollywood, high definition movie. You know, it's not your dreams. It's literally like a movie. And then you're in this movie and things happen. And it's very, very intense because it's not dreams. It's actually stuff being, you know, sent into your eyes and your ears. And then she said, oh, she was at the morgue and I was lying there dead. I'm like, oh, man, doesn't that sound like a staple oh, intel? Man. So imagine yeah. my mom just watched the previous night, me being dead at the funeral home, but just about in, in, incinerated in a, in, a, in a morgue. And I just said to her, and I said to my mom, listen, if you ever, if you ever are made to watch shit like that again, you say that you want the director sacked. And that kind of like made her laugh and she got over it. But we all know this thing. I think all of us sort of at some point experience synthetic dreams. And and it's just, you know, that is how powerful neurotech is. It and totally your parents takes sort of giving your parents giving you some kind of indication that she appears to have been taken over neurally. Exactly. You know, I think that all of us have experienced that. I, that sort of reminds me of the, the, my, the occasion when my father called me in the middle of the night for him. It was past 2 a.m. for him. He's in India and I'm here, you know, and it's like there's a 10 and a half hour difference. Um, he calls me at 2 a.m. in the morning and he said, this is what he said. He said, I woke up. It was almost as if a voice said to me, I have to call you and tell you <laughs> to get a new car. I'm thinking, no, you don't say. <laughs> it's like that. You that way. Did the voice say I should get one of these new cars that are totally like interfaced to the CIA through the digital computer? Did the right, voice say the something kind like of that? The, the kind of new cars that Michael Hastings perhaps drove that you know cruise control <laughs> exactly. can be easily messed with from outside. And so my father has been in the U.S. several times, and he this was a year after he'd been here, and he had a whole bunch of dental work done over here. So think about it. Dental implants are well patented. There is enough information about tooth chips. Pick up stuff. I can show you the patent. 
<laughs> so, um, so I'm convinced my dad is implanted at this point in time. How else would he wake up in the middle of the night and say, it's almost like I heard a voice saying that it must have been a dream, he said. I, I feel the, the urge. I felt the urge to call you and tell you to get a new car. <laughs> oh my and god we have sort of a 10 or 12 year old car it's not one of these fancy remote control things this is, Ramola this is actually the bombshell evidence because because uh, many people and I had the, um, the strong suspicion so here in, Ger in, in Germany uh, not in Switzerland but in Germany they had something called the Abschrott Prämie, so that the German word for um, you got money from the government, imagine, if you got rid of your really old car. And they said, oh, that's because these old cars, they're really bad for the environment. They're spewing stuff. And then you think, hang on a second, you've got all these lorries on the road. Why don't you start with them? It's like, no, no, mm -hmm. not with them. Start with your private car. And then people have said, isn't it because you want to force us on to put it, having the new cars that have, by the way, people have said that the new cars, some of them already have the auto drive um, functionality in there. So the intelligence agencies can take over your car when, whenever they want to, even though you haven't paid for self-driving capabilities, they will just self-drive your car. And this is part of what came out in those Vault 7 documents, by the way, yeah. that the CIA has that capability. And, Good point. Um, yeah, that's where it come, came from. Yes, and then we've got, you know, Michael Hastings, and then we also have, you know, little me who's driving to Brussels trying to work with Melanie. And my car, that's so old, it certainly doesn't have cruise control, suddenly has cruise control, and it automatically accelerates up to the speed limit in the country that I'm in. You know, so it's it, by itself, it accelerates up to 130 on the motorway. And when I cross the border to Switzerland, it automatically goes to 120 kilometers per hour by wow. itself. It seemed to, you know, the cruise control just appeared yeah. and, you know, the local traffic rules. That's pretty amazing that it would actually do that by itself. Yeah, by itself. Yeah, by itself, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> quote unquote. Oh my gosh. I, I actually just just a second because I, I just had an eye onto the um the uh, uh chat mm -hmm. and in the chat somebody made the point. Um they said the panel need to engage its audience from time to time. You are losing your audience because you do not do not feel um because they do not feel included in the techno crime fighter forum. All TIs are fighting a battle. Yes, that's true. So this is a uh, um this is a, a comment in the chat. Actually, today it's very hard for us to interface with the chat because the chat is super mm -hmm. fast, and we're it's only very, it's very hard. And this is why I can't quite keep up with it. I personally am very I find it very difficult to kind of continue a conversation plus look at the chat. But um, you know, one of the things that um, uh, I am, have managed to do. So someone somebody got in touch with me over Twitter, and it kind of fits the um, fits the topic. And they said that they would hear um, us talk. They would like to hear us talk about um, holographic projections, and it kind of fits into the topic of psychiatry because. These holographic projections are, are, as I've heard, really spectacular. And um, I have so far not consciously actually seen one, but um, the people who have say it is really spectacular. And you think really that somehow aliens have landed and they are walking around in your in your house and, you know, all sorts. You know, some people had medieval knights walking around in their home or whatever, you know, monsters, mm -hmm. everything. And uh, Millicent also said that she had the spiral whirl and, you know, um, Randall she Webster. Had said it here. I think she saw Randall Webster the very first time when he started hitting her with, new, with tech. Uh, he appeared at the foot of her bed and said, I'm in intelligence. And, you know, something. something like, no, like son. <laughs> you and intelligence have so nothing to do with each other. <laughs> well, you see, yeah. that's the irony that the word intelligence is being used by the intelligence agencies. And it's, I, it's, I think, fairly plain and clear to all of us. They're not exercising the least amount of intelligence. I, I think it's Just sort of. Agree and barbarism. Yeah, I think it's it's um, one of these. It's actually this this sort of Illuminati habit of reversing everything. So whatever's called the intelligence agency, you can be sure that will be devoid of intelligence. You know. Yeah, yeah. Sort of savage stupidity. But I think you know the the holographic projections. We should maybe leave to um, next time because um, we should. Well, but I, because I think I'd like to look at a few. Um, I'd like to bring up a few patterns. Millicent actually sent me a lot of information about oh, yeah. how um, I think it was both the Navy and the Air Force. I'm, I'm getting confused. Maybe it's the Navy and uh, DARPA who are studying holographic projection. So there's some information out there. Right. So we should pull that out. Um, if, as far as uh, keeping up with the chat and so forth, what I would 
what I would like to say perhaps is that maybe we should set up um, set up a, a session at some point when all of us are here, where we can actually look at the chat and people can come into the chat and throw some questions out and you know have us look at them or whatever. Um, because on a regular basis, it's kind of difficult to to keep that on that. I, I actually, that's, I think, is a really, really good idea. So I think at some point, actually, we've got a couple of things coming up that we're going to launch over the coming weeks where people will have a lot of questions. And um, I think that's a brilliant idea that we have, um, you know, a, a plenary forum when people can ask us all their questions and, you know, all um, five of us are there. And we can mm -hmm. just answer it because I think among us, we've got so much expertise and, um, you know, insight um, also from what victims send us that, you know, we, we should we should actually do that. I think it's a brilliant idea. Just, just based on our work, whatever we, we've come across and we have access to, I think. Um, one of the things I wanted to say is, you know, you had mentioned right at the start of the show that you wanted people to videos and start putting out their daily experiences. And I think that's a brilliant idea. You remember we talked a little bit briefly about possibly doing a kind of a 30-day journal. Video journal is great, but I, I, we can't quite convince Karen and Melissa, I think, to do a video journal every day. Written journal, what about, what about if each of us did a written journal? And we can ask other people around us as well, whoever's interested to do the same thing. And we could find a central spot, maybe on the JIT website, upload people's daily journals. And if anybody wanted to do this kind of 30-day super journal challenge with us, we just sign them up. It could be in the middle of any month. Just do it for 30 days from, from that day to the next month day. Um, and we, basically what you're recording is you're being hit that particular day everything you experience and then if you want to throw in any speculations any patterns any information related to your hits just throw it in and if you have photographs from that day or videos from the day throw it in you know so we just need a place to upload this that's well, a I brilliant idea you know what i that's that's fantastic because um actually two things number one is that um, for court cases to get across to um, judges how intensely we're being um, targeted and also to compare everybody's testimony so that the judge can see, oh, it's not just one person, it's literally everybody. Um, I think this, this journaling is fantastic and I think we should have, I mean, I have logbooks and logbooks of this stuff, but um, not everybody has. So if we start now, because this targeting is not going to stop, and just journal over 30 days all the stuff that's being done to us daily and say, mm -hmm. well, this is now, you know, symptomatic for the, the other months per year and the other years, that's mm -hmm. going to be worth gold. And the one thing I thought is that if everybody sends the journal to us, I mean, maybe you remember in the very beginning, we used to have this life sign monitor on my website and still there with the, you know, the soldiers because oh, we're yes. hit so hard. And I wanted everybody to check in every day because we didn't know if we're going to make it when we first started working together. Um, mm -hmm. And I have to say, if we have this bottleneck, um, we will be hit and then everything will grind to a, you know, to a halt. So actually, I've got a better idea, which is the following. I will teach people how to make a website for free and really quickly. I'll mm -hmm. make a, um, an instruction video and then everybody uploads it to their own website because that way we're also harder to sabotage because there's not just That's one great. site. That's great. And you know what else? else? And also, maybe call it a journal website. You know, maybe people can do this on WordPress or some other free option online just for this purpose, you know, and just call it the, maybe we can come up with a name, you know, it's the 30 day journal, um, targeting journal website or whatever. And um, if everybody sets up their own, and then we just stick the links together on a certain web page on the GIT side. That's brilliant. That would be cool as well. You know, you exactly. That's, I think, is brilliant because then, um, you know, we do have a central place to collect everybody who's, um, you know, they just send us mm -hmm. the link to their website. And also, I think um, everybody, even the people who are not into um, programming or media, need to learn how to make a website. They need to find out how easy it is these days. Oh, yes. It's super because easy. Just for basic writing, it is super easy. Exactly. It's, you know, it gets a bit complex when you do other things. But, yeah. And and I think we should do that and we should teach them how to um, set up a website because I also, what I want people to do is that um, start giving them a voice back and start um, allowing them how to report about this in exactly the same oh, right. way. And you see, doing. that that's my intent as well. And that's my hope as well, to, to encourage people to report. Reporting. And uh, when we do a blow-by-blow -blow kind of thing, like a day-by-day -day account, we kind of establish for the world to see that this is most definitely happening. 
and that many people are reporting precisely this. Now, I already, now we all know that already targeting, gang stalking, quote unquote gang stalking, organized stalking, all that stuff. If you look into, look into Google or any search engine, you get millions of hits, right? There's a lot of information on the web already. But because there are also lies being put out by mainstream media, system and her psychiatrist friends, the educated part of the populace, right? Completely discounting, completely disbelieving. Millions of people around the world and simply sticking to the false and fake New York Times articles to consider all reporting victims insane. This phenomenon, I think we kind of need to establish various means by which the reports of victims and are presented in a format such that they cannot be disputed, you know? And I think I'm hoping to do that with my interviews. And actually, I, at this point, I should probably say, this is what I also wanted to say, Catherine, before we close. Um, everybody who's interested in publicizing or sharing their story, because, you know, you literally have to be at a point of being publicized your story, because your name will be associated with it. You will become known online. For what you speak out about, you know, because that fame is instant currently on the internet. It's nothing really. It's like your name just gets thrown out there, your face gets thrown out there, you become known. So if you are prepared for that, if you are prepared to become known and to stand up for humanity and speak out about the use on humanity, please contact me and do an interview with me and we'll call it your TI testimonial or your video testimonial and I'll attach it to documentary archive. So you will be part of my documentary archive. Um, you know, I'm a, so in a sense, I can give you that as a journalist, I can give you that platform to put to, to hold or house your testimonial, you know? And um, I think that would I think that's useful because in a sense it gives uh, people who are watching that there is a journalist who is listening to these stories and who is reporting these stories rather than just a voice line saying I'm being hit. Now you're sort of, you know, using the platform of a journalist. So to that extent, I can offer that. And so I encourage everybody to send me emails. Okay. Help me to get to know your story and then we can do a podcast together. Um, I'm already being contacted by various people, so I'll just have to put you on a list. But I can promise you that I don't forget anybody, anyone I speak to who's interested in putting their story out there. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to put your story out there. Story out there. So please, please get in touch. So I just wanted to you know, say that. I, I think this is fantastic because um, as we are moving forward, I always say to people that... Um, uh, what this is, is, um, I mean, there are two analogies I, I use, which kind of show what, what this is about, which is, um, you know, um, number one, as I, I, in the video I did last night, my first live war update and one of these daily updates, um, in the second half, I'm talk talking about how the system can be flipped. How can we flip a crime cartel on its roof? And um, I'm using the example of, of how to flip cars on their roof. And you can see the video, it's all described. But it's, um, you know, the, at, at, at heart, you have to keep rocking the car and use resonance. You don't just push once. You, with a group of people, you keep pushing rhythmically the same over, the same over, and eventually it flips over using resonance. And I think we have to do the same thing, you know, going public, doing interviews, um, recording also the victim testimonies, because these are Holocaust victims. Yes, so, and that's you know, why I'm very keen. I'm very keen to get victim testimonies out there. This is a Holocaust. And we know it. Some of us know it. Those of us who know it have a responsibility to bring this information to the world. I, I think we do. And actually, on the topic of Holocaust, let me share my screen and point to um, information that was tweeted to me just today by Stop Mind Control um, here. And um, this lady tweeted me um, a video that she did, and it's very powerful, actually. So I will also put out, um, you know, videos of how to make um, how to make the YouTube videos we're doing, and so on and so on, because people need to imitate us. And this woman um, just got online, mm -hmm. and what she did is she pointed to the entire list of people. So here in the video, she um, lists all the people who, who already have been murdered. And um, also, she points to where you can find their individual blogs, and it's hugely powerful because. Um, 
we will go back and we will actually roll up these cases of these murders. And everything that people put out on blogs and so on will now be used by the community. So I'm not saying, oh, as soon as you make a blog, you'll be murdered. No, what I'm saying is that now we're in the phase where we're bringing all this together, having your testimony out on a blog really helps us to combine cases and show the world, you know, and, and also to go back and look at these past cases of, of the Holocaust as it was raging and get justice for the people who have died. Mm -hmm. I think that's brilliant. Do send me that link so I can also include it on my website. Yeah, I think um, the only problem is that it's in German, but she basically goes um, through and links all the um, all the websites where um, people were already listed as you know murder victims of the of the intelligence agencies and so on. And um, but I think what we have to do over the next coming weeks is um, really get more and more people on board. And the second analogy I have is literally what we're doing now is we're building a rescue helicopter and start to take off. So the ground below us is crashing and we have to get we everything are, into this. We are. Absolutely. And that's a great analogy. And Catherine, I just wanted to say, because you bring that up, um, it reminds me that there are various other aspects of this that we want to that we want to address. We obviously can't do it today and we'll do it another day. Um, and not just to talk about, but to actually set up plans to, you know, help people technically to 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 fund implants to determine sources of microwave emission in their neighborhoods, etc., and uh, and ways to stop this targeting, you know, on a, in a very distinctive way. So that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect is also something that someone who um, contacted me from the UK talked about, which I thought was very pointful. You know, basically she, like everybody else, has been blacklisted. She needs a job. She needs money. And so we talked a little bit about possibly setting up some kind of online co-op that people who are targeted, who are being blacklisted, could pull in, bring in their resources, and we could, you know, set up some kind of service website or something where people could um, get work online so that we can, um, we can help people who have talents and who have great skills, but unfortunately aren't being given jobs because they're being blacklisted and defamed in their immediate local communities yeah. so can we help them online mm -hmm. i think this is brilliant because actually when i um so when i was in germany this is really amusing me because um you know when i was in germany i wanted to uh, launch a startup and it was exactly that it was um to get uh, marginalized groups um you know work and i that's when when the the targeting operation really hit me full whack it <laughs> was actually funny. munich going to the startup scene you know and um trying to do that but yes i'm actually totally all for it and um i think over the next coming months what we'll do is is, um, you know, in this uh, helicopter analogy, um, you know, when you when you think about a helicopter actually starting up, you have the blades, you know, first rotating really slowly, but then the blades do the same thing over and over and progress is actually how fast the, the blades are rotating. And I mm -hmm. think what we should do over the coming months is actually recruit more and more victims to come forward because already... Now, so many victims who have come forward, by the way, I just want to sh point people to the staggering amounts of high profile people who, who actually publicly talk about their targeting. Because mm -hmm. actually, just very briefly, there's um, very big names who now openly talk about this. And I think people should um, know about this and actually link it in their court cases as evidence. Number one is Stephen Shellen, a Hollywood actor who openly talked about it. You can find him on YouTube. The other person who's actually public, and I, I think I just today, I got the Newsweek article is actually John McAfee. So I tweeted the link about the article about um, John McAfee, and he has been uh, basically um, hunted by this crime cartel and had all sorts of entrapment and set up operations. So they oh, murdered his Oh, yes. Gosh. I mean, for those who don't know, John McAfee is this, um, I personally suspect he's a math prodigy, um, but he is this, you know, computing uh, genius who um, actually was, I think, the first person who um, really spotted that computer viruses will become a big thing. And... Um, he heard about, a, I, I remember an interview with him and he heard a, um, about a computer hack somewhere on television. And then he, he said, he was thinking about it and then he wondered how the hell did these guys do it? And then he figured it out and he was like, oh my goodness, I think I know how they did it. And he built a solution. So that was the, the, um, the start of the uh, McAfee antivirus software. 
So this guy became a multimillionaire and so on. But now the cartel wants to take him out. You know, I think they they tried to float people and then harvest people in the harvesting that didn't work with John McAfee. So now this article in Newsweek that I tweeted out is about him. Basically, um, they tried to kidnap him and murder him for various reasons. And how this guy is just having a total standoff by himself against the crime cartel. It's the most, it's, it's such a mind blowing story. Even yeah, I'm I have to read it. Yeah. yeah. So if you look yeah. at my tweets, it's, it's linked there just from today. So there's John McAfee. The other really important interview I want to point people to is actually Catherine Austin Fitz, who I mention as often oh, yes. as I can, can because her testimony, uh, it's not this one, hang on, it's the other the other screen, I think it's um, this one. Yes. So I encourage everybody to um, listen mm -hmm. to the interview with Catherine Austin Fitz called Entrainment, Mind Control and the Fall of America. Now, this was recorded at the end of September. And this interview is mind blowing because she, she spills the beans on absolutely everything. And she really spells it out. And also she educates people about the financial aspect. So that is worth gold. But the other thing that she also does is she um, explains to people how she thinks her mother was murdered by the crime cartel mm -hmm. and how she became targeted after that. So very big bombshell information. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, with her Solari report, she does some great interviews. And there's that great interview she did with Adam Tromley about brain entrainment and mind control technology so that's another exactly that's that that's a great point from all actually this is this is um you know these are all these fantastic references and i want um people to now see the progress because we've got all these public figures talking openly and i just want to um, show up three documents not talk about them just show them i know we have to wrap up but just very briefly um the documents that people should um download um, is as I said, I um, for court cases, go to covertharassment.com, uh, sorry, covertharassmentconference.com. Um, and here at the bottom, so down here, there are two links for um, Carl Clark's um, testimony down here, one German, one in English. These are two PDF documents. This is the interview in English and in German. Please download it and inc include it in your court bundle because he's one of the key whistleblowers. The other mm -hmm. testimonies to download that are very important are on stopthecrime.net, the article on mind control by Dr. Ronnie Kilder, who is this doctor who was murdered. She has seven pages on top information about all the legal endeavors to stop this mind control and the satellite um, terror network and, 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 and. So that's her here. And um, this is really a document you have to include in your court case, you know, because it comes from the um, former chief medical officer of Finland. So this has a lot of weight. Another document that you must include in your court bundle, in my view, that has a lot of weight and that I've only heard about recently is the testimony, the affidavit of Bill Binney, the former technical director of the NSA. And this is the first time I heard about it, but um, it's, it's, you can find it on hotinthenews.net. And this is um, a testimony that's submitted for the court case of, um, how do you pronounce it, Shuhat versus Donald Trump, um, a yes, big case. News recently, yes, that, you know, he's supporting this person's court case as an expert witness. Absolutely. And here is this is the 15 page affidavit by uh, William Binney. And it is absolutely mind blowing. I think it's one of the greatest services to humanity writing this down and giving it as an affidavit, because even though this is the affidavit written for this court case, you can still download it and quote it, quote it in your own court case, you know, so it doesn't actually because it's a public document, it doesn't say that you can oh you can only use it in one court case. No, it's become a public record, a public document. So but this is mind blowing. I think yeah, that the I power of the it, Yeah, I, I should add it actually. I'm setting up a, um, a, um, a page on my website called Targeting is Real. And I'm just collecting whistleblower testimony on that page. Links. I put all the PDFs, all the documents that, I, that would be useful in a court case, but also just whistleblower testimony about the reality of this targeting, you know, and put it together. Looking at all of that together, there's absolutely nobody, you know, with a basic education who can look at these documents and say, this is not happening, this is not going on. So um, I'm trying to collect it all in one, one place. So I will add that. I haven't got that as yet. William Linney's affidavit. There are other affidavits, and I have them on there, you know, like uh, Ted Gunderson's affidavit, 
and um, Gerald Sosby has written extensively about the way he's targeted by the FBI and CIA and so forth. So one of the, a couple of the things that we did not have time to get to today um, were um, a focus on infiltrators in our midst. Oh, yeah. Who are simply <laughs> attacking and assaulting all of us in very many different ways, often very sweetly. Quote unquote. Um, you know, this whole notion of leadership among TIs. Um, <laughs> these these things make us laugh. But you know, I think it's it's worth talking about some of the some of the issues here because literally all of this has to do with controlling the opposition and it has to do with FBI and CIA infiltration. And also in our case, because we are the victims of weapons testing and MK Ultra Neuro experimentation, uh, we're also talking about infiltrators from DARPA. Um, the intelligence agencies, from all of the intelligence agencies, including the British ones. Yes. Oh, hell yes. <laughs> Especially think, the British ones. As I think you certainly know. And, and what exactly they're trying to accomplish in our midst. And I think it's very worth addressing that. Um, because it's important to be aware in which the narrative is being shifted to shape public narratives and attempts are being made to stop people like you and I who are speaking out openly, to keep us from speaking out openly and speaking out, speaking our minds, you know, which is what they're all about and which no one's going to be able to stop, but they're certainly making some attempts. Um, oh, yeah. So, you know, and, and also that whole concept of psychological warfare, which I thought we'd have time to dive into today, but uh, we haven't. So we'll definitely pick up on that. Um, I think this is brilliant because I think we have to have a special entire episode on infiltration, psycho warfare, and, and saboteurs. And actually, now that you brought it up, yes, I do want to pull the trigger on basically Brian Tew, who's now, first of all, he excelled in trying to, he libeled me to the entire victim community in a massive um, email list three times in a row claiming I'm not a physicist. Then he claimed, oh, maybe I'm a physicist, but I've never worked at CERN. And then I gave people evidence that I have worked at CERN. It's like, yes, but but something else, you know, some people don't trust her. Well, you know, uh, it's now the third time it happened. And what Brian Tew has done is he systematically now over a, a very short period of time, he tried to um, smear and libel and slander um, each member of the Techno Crime for, um, Fighters Forum to other people. So Brian Tew slandered me back in, I think, March um, to all of you, to, to Karen and Ramola. Then there was silence. Then he slandered me again at some point early October or whenever it was, early November. Then he slandered Millicent. He slandered Millicent mm -hmm. to Karen and Ramola. And then he slandered Ramola to Karen, and it just goes on and on and on, and Karen to everybody. It's like, come on, Brian, this doesn't work. We don't buy your bullshit. Stop trying and think about who you're working for and if you really want to work for such people. I mean, how pathetic can you be? But this is yes. the sort of you know, Since you bring a Brian to you, I suppose, you know, we have to address this issue that uh, unfortunately he has indeed kept slandering you, and he's recently written to me um you know trying to tell me you're a government infiltrator and you may be a physicist but you're working for somebody else and uh the fact that you're using all this aluminium foil is an attempt to discredit me and uh so on and so forth and he said similar things about millicent i mean well slightly different but similar in terms of slander um that millicent's story is different fantastical to be true etc now i did respond to brian about millicent and, you know, I spent ages studying Melissa's story and putting her article together, writing an article on her case. So I directed him to that. And I said, there's no way you can look at Melissa's case and call her story fantastical or delusional because she has rock hard, solid evidence. You know, she has done the tests. She has the MRIs. She has the scanning information. Thing she says about implants she has is backed up by information from somebody who's done a physical scan of the body, mapped out the sites of those implants, the sites from where radio frequencies are being transmitted from the body. So that information is there. And besides, Millicent is a brilliant researcher. She has put together so much information that would make anybody's head spin. And she's constantly giving us information, you know, on everything that she has uncovered about um, these dark operations that the CIA and the DOD are running and various military 
uh, other units, you know, the US, US Air Force, the Navy, etc. So she's, and she's somebody who puts things together as well. She's able to see the big picture. She, she ha holds a doctorate as well. She has advanced degrees. She, this is somebody who is academically employed and who is a brilliant researcher. So to come along and to say that she's fantastical and delusional is, I'm sorry, it doesn't hold water with somebody like me who's at, who, who can actually look at what she's putting out there and recognize the brilliance of um, Millicent's talent. You know, Absolutely. her intellectual acumen. Absolutely. I think Brian too has never read the article you've written about Millicent. And I think what little Brian doesn't understand is that behind the scenes, we have sh sent each other so much documentation that he doesn't see because it's not, not everything is public, but we exchange amongst ourselves. And you know what really, no, and it, what really got me, sorry, this was sad. Yeah. Sorry, no say, sorry. No, go ahead. You had a thought. <laughs> I, basically, what I want to say to Brian is that it shows me that we have these people who are basically just, sorry, this is a British impression, talking outside, you know, out of their rear sides. And then they think we're doing the same thing. It's like, no, my friend, we're actually backing it up with evidence. We, we're not just, you know, making stories up and have, you know, the, the image of targeting a sort of like lifetime career where we're being paid for by governments, as some people we pretty much suspect are, you know, they pre pretend an entire life that they're being targeted and get payout from them from the government. No, some of us actually have freaking evidence, Brian. So what's your problem? Yes, I absolutely. And that's what I try to remind them. There is evidence here. We are speaking about evidence. And as far as you and aluminum foil is concerned, I told him, well, you know, I also use aluminum foil all around me and Reflectix. And, you know, it does save my skin because it does block those microwaves. So, um, you know, there is a story and this, we should go into it in greater detail on another occasion because we should wrap up pretty soon. But there is a story going around that there are the ways in which we are hit, we cannot shield from it all. And that is absolute BS. It is a total lie. And, you know, I can stand up and, and, and testify that there is, I am, you know, an absolute proof in myself of having been able to withstand these onslaughts and assaults for, for four years, just through use of shielding of different kinds. So it really depends what tech you're being hit with, because there's no doubt there's a variety of tech that everybody's being hit with. And the newer tech certainly is very hard to shield from. All of us, you know, our brainwaves are being removed and, you know, stuff is being pumped back in. We're all being newly influenced in some way or the other. And they, it's very hard to shield from that. Many people are getting synthetic telepathy and they're getting voice to skull. Many people are getting synthetic images and dreams, synthetic smells, etc. And that's very hard to shield from, no doubt. Um, so, and people say the scalar tech that penetrates all of your shielding. And, you know, that's very hard to shield from as well. But some basic, you know, help like the kind of um, Teflon that I was talking about, the bakeware and the cookie sheets and the uh, re Reflectix or the Mylar that um, Catherine uses or the, the foil that you use, the baking foil, it does help shield from microwave directed energy weapons attacks from maybe your neighbor's house, you know? So some of the stuff you can indeed shield from and some of it is actually external. So that's the other issue I wanted to talk about later, you know? Robert Duncan's no touch torture and it's all coming from your brain. You're not really being hit. Well, no, sorry, Duncan. You know, we are being hit. We're being hit with directed energy weapons, not just with neurotech. Yeah. That's assaulting our brains, our bodies as well. Yeah, I think I, I'm, I'm, I find Duncan's disinfo even more damaging because it kind of implies, oh, it's just in your head, you know? No, 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 no. This is actually military weapons. And, and also, I think it's this is being put out so that we don't go after our neighbors, you know? Yes, because exactly. our neighbors there are There is guilty. a huge push. There's a huge push. And remember, you know, Julianne McKinney, Eleanor White, those known um, government infiltrators in our midst, constantly telling us it's not your neighbors. Similarly with Brian too, I think he says the same thing, it's not your neighbors. Exactly, well, exactly. And it's not your neighbors for some things, but it is your neighbors for some other things, okay? Absolutely. I'm being hit from very close by. A lot of what I'm being hit with, it's coming from cars parked on the street. It's coming from my own neighbor using uh, a, an equip using lawnmowers or some other kind of garden equipment that's been doctored in some way. It's coming from cars that are zooming up and down my street with um, stuff in them okay, that are parking diagonally and hitting me. This is a continuous endeavor. I have been hit from helicopters. 
you know, all this. It's coming from, from areas that we know where it's coming from. We know it's coming from our immediate vicinity. So there is a lot of disinfo out there. And, you know, yeah, we should, we should definitely. Actually, just that. one last thing, and then we can wrap up. Because um, on the shielding issue, I will just point you to um, this site, which is Leader Tech, a Heiko company. Heiko is a very, very big, you know, company, as far as I know. And this, they are, this is for industry, okay? So they are talking about how to um, provide RF, um, so a radio frequency shielding for businesses. And what do they write here? Popular metals used in RF shielding, pre tin plated steel, copper, you know, aluminium. Mm -hmm. And it says, although aluminium does pose a few fabrication challenges, it is still an excellent choice for a number of applications, mostly due to its non-ferrous properties, its strength to weight ratio, and its high contact conductivity. Um, yeah, and I would say the fact that it's cheap. It's cheap. You know, there it it's is. It's cheap, and that's price. exactly why. I mean, that's why we're all, you know, copper is very expensive. It's very hard to even yeah. get a sheet of copper that's, you know, that's below $20. So Absolutely. getting anything bigger than a small sheet that's uh, five by eight or whatever gets to be very expensive. Aluminum is cheap, you know, that's why they're using it. Yeah. Sorry, um, Brian. The problem is I am a physicist, you know, in your case, <laughs> jackass. <laughs> On which note? <laughs> On which note? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps we should bring this uh, interesting conversation to an end and, uh, you know, just decide to wait into a few more people next time uh, <laughs> on our next Techno Grand Fighters Forum. So unless you have anything last minute to say to the world. No, no, that's, um, that's it. Effie David um, is going to come, you know, and then the next thing will be that we're going to inform the neighbors as well. But that's for another show. We'll talk about that later. Yes, <laughs> most definitely. The neighbors, we've all got things to say about our neighbors. My God, the neighbors, you know, they're, they're giving themselves away every minute. They're begging to be sued, apparently. So... <laughs> <laughs> On which note, let's wish everybody a fabulous day and, you know, happy Thanksgiving again. And thank you for watching us. And um, Oh, one thing. Uh, Monday is Cyber Monday. Today is Black Friday. If you want any technical equipment, like an audio recorder that you should have, a digital camera, and a power bank so that they don't um, drain your mobile phone battery, pick it up now because apparently they are really good deals. And a dash cam, you know, any of those devices oh, for yes, TRS. Dash cam, excellent idea. I definitely need you one. Get the deals now. And Cyber Monday, yes. don't forget Cyber Monday. <laughs> you know? Oh, I see. So Cyber Monday is a little more than Black Friday? Uh, well, it depends which country you're in, but I think both. I think one is for online shopping and the other one is in the stores. Oh, and I um, so I think um, Cyber Monday is used by stores like eBay and other places like Amazon, I think. And it's like Black Friday. But my point is that, you know, all these victims who are really stretched for their finances, I think Black Friday is the day to pick up all this electronics, you know, to try to guard yourself and, and also shielding. Maybe you can get, you know, shielding at a reduced price. Shielding as well. Absolutely. Yes. Brilliant. No, that's a brilliant reminder. Thank you. I definitely have to do that. Hit the online stores. I'm not really going to go to a mall at this point in time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you good tip all right everyone thanks very much for watching and we'll see you very soon next week next thursday we hope <laughs> bye, bye for now